say that you just I, I, got to do it at some point. Well, chief of staff and all that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Katherine Harrington. I'm the chair of the Washington County Board of Directors and the Board of Clean Water Services. I've been asked to start our meeting off today. Uh, so uh, hopefully you've all seen the detailed agenda with the estimated time. So the first thing we'll do is go through introductions and then elect a presiding officer for the remainder of the meeting. So, uh, um, yes, thank, Mr. Jockers. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I appreciate that very much. Um, you're right, I, I wanna set a little bit of context. Thank you, I think you provided that as well. First of all, thank you all for being here today. I, I don't have to say it again, but I will anyway. I'm sorry that we're not here in person. Um, we are live on uh, Clean, uh, Clean Water Services YouTube channel as well as Washington County's YouTube channel. For, so for the record, I'll introduce myself as Mark Jockers, the Chief of Staff for Clean Water Services. I also want to, uh, viewers to understand that our budget committee is comprised of our five board members who also serve as the Washington County Commissioners and five citizen members. And I'd like as that introduction, as the chair had mentioned, um, as an introduction, I'd like to go ahead and walk through those members. And if you could unmute when I call your name and um, just acknowledge your presence, say hello. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with our board members. Um, chair Harrington, I think we know you're here. Morning, everyone, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Jerry Willie, has he joined us yet? Okay. He, he has not, Mr. Juckers. He is uh, just having a little difficulty, so I'm working on getting him in for you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Pam Trees. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, District 2 Commissioner. Nice to see you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rogers. Yes, I'm here. My camera is not working for some reason, but thank you, Mark. I represent District 3, which is the southeastern quadrant, so... Thank you. And Commissioner Nafisa Five. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Nafisa here. Um, District One. Good. Thank you. And then the citizen members, the community members, rather, from CWAC are, are drawn from CWAC, and I'll you know, go ahead and acknowledge them. So, Terry Song. Good morning. Uh, Terry Song, Chair and Business Representative on the CWAC. Lori Hennings. Good morning. I'm Lori Hennings. It's nice to see you all. I am the one of the environmental reps on CWAC. Thank you. Uh, Mike McKillop. Good morning. Uh, I represent on CWAC. I represent Roy Rogers District Three. District Three. Thank you. Fatima Taha. Good morning, everyone. This is Fatima Taha, at large representative. And Matt Wellner. Good morning, this is Matt Wellner. I'm one of the builder developer reps on CWAC. 
Good. And uh, Commissioner Willie, have you joined us? I have. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Jerry Willie, District 4. Thank you very much. Um, we hope to run an efficient and especially entertaining budget committee today. I know for, for uh, our board, who serves as the Washington County Commission, this is the beginning of a long budget season for them. And I'm hoping that we can just keep things going. We are scheduled to go from 9 to 1.30 today. We will have a break at 11.30 for one hour for lunch. And I know that we've sent all of you treats, so hopefully you've been able to get your lunch. Um, today's meeting will include an overview, as you've seen on the agenda, of the district's financial situation, followed by presentations from each of the seven departments. And we'll go through there. Committee members can raise their hands uh, to ask a question. Uh, we also have uh, Washington County Clerk Kevin Moss, who will be helping us run this meeting. So if he sees something, he'll bring that up too. Time is reserved at the end of each presentation for questions, although if you want to speak up during a presentation, you can do that. Uh, and the budget committee chair, once we elect that person, will acknowledge those raised hands as they're there. We'll have two opportunities for public comment, one following the overview of the district's financial health and budget, and a second after the final presentation this afternoon before the requested action. Um, and with that, I would like to go, go ahead and hand it over to our CEO, Diane Tanikuchi Dennis, is going to say a few things and we can get into the process of nominating and electing the chair. Thank you, Mark. We're just delighted to have the Clean Water Services Budget Committee and the public joining us today. And um, we're very um, excited to present um, our budget. Um, with that, I'm going to turn that over to um, Chair Harrington. Thank you, Diane. I know we're going to have a really information-packed uh, time together today. Our budget committee meetings always uh, include really great overviews of what's been happening on the research side, on the customer service side, on equipment improvements, uh, financial stability. It's just all rich information. And I look forward to hearing your questions. So um, we elected board members really appreciate having our CWAC members join us as part of the budget committee, but most importantly, having one of you serve as the presiding officer for the budget committee. And with that, I would like to recommend uh, or ask for a motion to appoint Karen Song uh, the chair of CWAC as our budget committee presiding officer. Is there someone who would be willing to make that motion? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Hennings. And I see a second from uh, Director Treese. All those in favor, please vote by raising your hand or saying aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Any opposed? It's unanimous. So Mr. Song will turn the virtual gavel over to you. Thank you, Chair Harrington. So next up on our agenda would be overview of the Clean Water Services financial health and budget. Thank you, Terry. And um, I'm a, my name is Kathy Leader. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Clean Water Services and the Budget Officer for the, the district. I wanted to start out just to give a brief description of the purpose of the meeting today for those that are watching uh, remote uh, and uh, the public and those new to the committee. The Budget Committee meeting is being held in compliance with Oregon local budget law. The purpose of this meeting is for the committee to receive the district's proposed budget and budget message receive public comment, and finally deliberate and approve a budget for the district for the fiscal year 2023. The board will then preside over a public hearing in June where the public has another opportunity to provide comment. The board's final action will be the adoption of the district's fiscal year 2023 budget at the June board meeting. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna turn uh, the discussion over to, once again, to Diane Taniguchi-Dennis, our CEO. Thank you, Kathy. 
Um, I'm Diane Taniguchi Dennis, your Clean Water Services Chief Executive Officer, and we're just delighted to be here today. Clean Water Services is recognized as a world class regional utility that helps the people, businesses, and ecosystem in our region to grow and to thrive. Here in the Tualatin River watershed, we are a large region that returns water to a very beautiful but small, slow, and sensitive river. As the stewards of the Tualatin River, we are called on to anticipate and to solve complex water challenges in a very increasing uh, and more complicated regulatory compliance environment. And this challenges the team to not only be practical and pragmatic in our solutions, but to also be innovative to meet the service needs of this complex and growing region. It is important to differentiate and to define our service levels and to clearly understand the cost of providing these services. I'll quickly define regional and local services now and provide some examples a little later in my remarks. So the regional services benefit all customers and, and is provided by clean water services. The local services benefit the residents of specific jurisdictions. Seven of our partner cities, Beaverton, Cornelius, Forest Grove, Hillsboro, Sherwood, Tigard, and Tualatin, all provide local services in their communities. Clean Water Services provides local services in unincorporated urbanized areas of Washington County and within the city limits of our partner cities, Banks, Durham, Gaston, King City, and North Plains. So no matter where you are in the region, increased variability in weather patterns is affecting our operations. Our agile teams need to be equipped and trained and these are essential components to meeting the needs so that we can deliver our services no matter what we're faced with. Whether it's extreme heat, intense rainfall events, wildfire smoke that causes hazardous air conditions, a pandemic, or even an earthquake, we're dedicated to providing services 365 days a year and 24 hours a day. Clean Water Services is now 52 years old and our facilities and equipment are needing focused attention to manage its full life cycle of duty. We are managing our assets based on condition and reliability requirements to maintain these facilities and the equipment's uptime to maintain regulatory compliance. Our commitment is to be cost effective and efficient by carefully sequencing our plans to repair, replace, or even rehabilitate these important assets. We are also grappling with unprecedented supply chain issues and inflation. At Clean Water Services, one of the biggest supply chain issues involves the chemicals that are necessary for inf disinfection and treatment, but we're meeting every single one of those challenges. But also in every challenge is found an opportunity. And this is certainly the case, so if I can have the next slide, when it comes to generational change, within the clean water services workforce. Next slide, please, Clerk Moss. Our team is transforming with the changing of the generational guard. So today, the clean water services workforce is comprised of 80% are Gen X and millennials, and they're infusing great new energy into the organization. And there are 18% of us are still baby boomers, but we'll probably in the next five years be on our trajectory for retirement. And the Gen Z is now at 2%. We're very excited about where this change in our workforce is taking us into the future. Next slide, please. For the next five years, Clean Water Services is focusing our policy strategy and actions to increase resilience in our operations and services to weather the challenges I've just outlined above, to align our people, our resources, and our programs to continue to demonstrate excellence and deliver value to the region with our lifeline services, to adapt and integrate policy and strategies so we can take action and make infrastructure investments that are practical and pragmatic to meet the needs of the Tualatin River watershed 
to strengthen our partnerships because partnership is the only path forward to solving the complicated water challenges our region faces. To sharpen our focus on the role that we play in advancing regional economic priorities and to harness the creativity and innovation of our employees today while preparing our water leaders for tomorrow. It's about learning, growing, and thriving as an organization and adapting our organizational culture. Next slide, please. This is a little more detail about regional services that are provided by Clean Water Services for the benefit of all customers. And these include operating, maintaining, and improving water resource recovery facilities where we clean used water, recover valuable nutrients, and harvest renewable energy to managing surface water, also known as storm water or rainwater, to managing the flows on the river, conducting watershed restoration, to operating, maintaining, improving, and building large regional conveyance assets, including trunk lines, interceptors, and pump stations, operating and managing the regional stormwater system of pipes and facilities for water quality and water quantity management. Next slide, please. Now let's turn to local services. Clean Water Services provides local services to customers within urbanized unincorporated Washington County and the five cities of Banks, Durham, Gaston, King City, and North Plains. And these uh, sanitary and stormwater services include the pipe inspection, the cleaning, the maintenance and repair, 24 hour emergency response, street sweeping and catch basin cleaning. And our seven cities of Beaverton, Cornelius, Forest Grove, Hillsboro, Tigard, and Tualatin all provide these local services directly to their communities. So in closing, we are committed to providing cost-effective and environmentally sensitive operations and management of the sanitary, sewer, and surface water services for this region. We're committed to restoring the ecological integrity of the Tualatin River watershed and protecting the health of all who call it home. We are committed to providing high quality services at a reasonable rate. And we are committed to continually seek and implement practical, pragmatic and innovative solutions to meet our challenges ahead. And we thank the board, our Clean Water um, Advisory Committee, our partners and most importantly, our ratepayers and our employees for enabling this very vital work. So now I'll turn it over to Kathy Leader, our Chief Financial Officer to discuss the financial assumptions in the preparation of the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. So first I'm gonna talk about revenue trends for the district. This slide shows actual revenues for fiscal year 20 and 21, budgeted revenue for fiscal year 22, and the proposed budget revenue for fiscal year 23 by type. Service charges are the single largest revenue source for the district, budgeted at 169.9 million for fiscal year 23, or 83% of the current revenues. Growth in this revenue over time reflects adopted rate increases and customer growth. The second largest revenue source is system development charges, budgeted at 22.3 million or 11% of the current revenues. These fees are assessed on new customers connecting to the system to share in the costs related to existing and new system capacity and performance improvements. These revenues are dedicated to capital projects. Other revenue sources include investment income budgeted at 5.5 million, Build America bond subsidies budgeted at 1.2 million and other outlays of 5.8 million. And these other outlays include revenues such as miscellaneous fees, grants, and contributions from developers for construction projects. Next slide, please. This slide provides a visual of current sources and uses of budgeted funds for fiscal year 23. The 204.8 million in budgeted current revenues will be used to fund 104 million in operating costs, 97.5 million in capital investments, and 17.2 million in debt service principal and interest payments. Next slide, please. The proposed
proposed fiscal year 23 budget includes a 4% increase in regional and local sanitary sewer rate and surface water management fee fees. These increases will add an estimated $2.29 per month to the typical residential customer bill. System development charges are proposed to increase based on pub the published engineering news record construction in cost index as of March 2022, which is 8.9%. The sanitary sewer system development charges will increase by $540 to $6,625 per equivalent dwelling unit and the stormwater management system development charge will increase by $56 to 641 per equivalent service unit. Later in this presentation, I will talk about the district's financial forecast, which is the basis of these recommended rate increases. Next slide, please. The district's average combined sanitary sewer and stormwater management rate charged to cities and urban unincorporated customers the district bills directly is proposed at $60.06 per month. This combined rate is lower than our comparable cities, including Vancouver, Salem, McMinnville, Lake Oswego, and Portland, even though the district provides a substantially higher level of wastewater treatment than nearly all local, regional, and national providers of comparable service. The district is able to provide a higher level of treatment at a lower cost because of our long-term financial strategy for service delivery. Next slide, please. The 10-year annual average increase in combined sanitary sewer and stormwater management rates is 3.4%. This trending reflects the district's adopted policy of reasonable rate increases on a regular or annual basis to promote predictability for the customer and revenue stability for the district. The, dis the district provided rate relief in fiscal year 21 in response to the pandemic. The deferral of planned rate increases in fiscal year 21 resulted in a loss of approximately 62 million in revenue to be collected over the next 10 year period. The district continues to prioritize and sequence investments in capital and hiring for vacancies and new positions in order to avoid rate spikes that could occur due to rate deferrals. Rate growth is vital to the long-term financial health of the district and its ability to invest in infrastructure for growth and resilience, maintain service levels, and meet increasingly stringent federal and state water pollution control needs. Next slide, please. This slide shows the combined sanitary sewer and stormwater management rates charged by the jurisdictions in our service area in fiscal year 21. Beginning in fiscal year 2009, Clean Water Services established a regional rate for services benefiting the entire region and a separate local rate for unincorporated Washington County and the city customers, which the district bills directly. The cities of Cornelius, Sherwood, Tualatin, Forest Grove, Tigard, Beaverton and Hillsboro charge and remit the regional rate to clean water services and it can establish their own local rate to meet local operating needs. The dark blue area of the bars on this chart represent the regional combined monthly rate of $40.70 charged by clean water services to all customers to support services that benefit the entire service area. The light blue area of the bars represents the local portion, portion charged by each jurisdiction to maintain local systems. For clean water services, this combined local rate of $14.50 is charged to the um, small cities and urban unincorporated customers. In most cases, the local rates charged by the cities have been consistently higher than the local rates charged by clean water services and the, vari and the variance has grown in recent years. The red solid line represents volume of customer, account, me, customer accounts by jurisdiction. Clean Water Service has been able to maintain lower rates for local services due to the size of our service area and customer base. You can see, next slide, please. You see this depicted on this slide. As shown here, Clean Water Services bills for just under 73,000 customers in cities and urban unincorporated areas. This is approximately 40% of the customers in Washington County. This is true for population also. The district service area for urban unincorporated 
in urban and excuse me, urban and unincorporated areas and select cities account for almost 43% of the population. The seven incorporated cities have a smaller customer base to spread costs of operations over and have increased their local rates to meet their individual local operating needs. Next slide, please. Next, I'm gonna talk about expenditure trends for the district. This slide shows actual expenditures for fiscal year 20 and 21, budgeted expenditures for fiscal year 22, and the proposed budget expenditures for fiscal 23 by type. The proposed fiscal year 23 budget includes current year expenditures of 219.6 million. Operating costs, including personal services and material and services, total 96.3 million, or 44% of the fiscal year 23 expenditures. Capital investment costs total 97.5 million, or 44% of the budget. Debt principal and interest payments account for 17.2 million or 8% of the budgeted expenditures. Other fund outlays of 8.6 million or 4% of the budget expenditures include utility bad debt expense, franchise fees collected and remitted to the cities, pass through a right of way and local, and local rates to the cities with industrial customers within their city limits and mid-year personnel adjustments. Total expenditures for fiscal year 23 increased by 8.3 million compared to the prior year, or 4%. Departmental operating expenditures increased by 7.4 million, or 8.4%, due to planned labor ads and increases for certain services. The district continues to navigate supply chain and inflationary issues. These impacts are reflected in the proposed budget. The district staff continues to to find innovative solutions to minimize cost impacts while meeting regulatory requirements. Capital investments increased by 3.9 million or 4.2%. Impacts from the current high inflation rate is uncertain and will, and will be managed using our just-in-time project delivery to monitor, prioritize, and sequence projects throughout the year. Debt service decreased by 4.5 million or 20.9% due to the savings from refunding of the series 2011 B bonds in 2021 with a net present value savings of over 6 million, as well as making the final debt service payment on the series 2011 A in fiscal year 22. Other outlays increased by 1.5 million or 22% due to an anticipated increase in utility bad debt based on current trends, equipment replacement needs and mid-year personnel adjustments. Next slide, please. As just noted, proposed operating costs for fiscal year 23 are 96.3 million, an increase of 7.4 million or 8.4% over the prior year. Staff from the individual programs will present details regarding planned operating costs and capital investments in fiscal year 23 um, later in the presentation. In general, labor costs increased by 3.3 million or 5.8%. This is mainly due to the addition of 13 new FTE and conversion of three long-term temporary staff to regular full-time status. Material and services increased by 4.2 million or 12.9%. The main drivers for this in cost increase relate to an increase in software licensing costs and increase in contracted professional services in particular for the new programs and services undertaken in fiscal year 2023 for culture equity and learning and strategy development and enterprise performance management. Other factors include the transition of treasury services in-house from the county and increases in operating costs to support expansion of natural system stewardship management sites in the community. These are all new key initiatives in this year's budget. Next slide, please. The district maintains a 10-year financial forecast to plan for needed rate increases, impacts of operating capital spending, and to identify the need for debt issuance. This slide shows five years of the district's current financial forecast, including estimated ending for fiscal year 22, the proposed budget for fiscal year 23, and projections for fiscal years 24 through 26. 
The layered bars represent expenditures by fiscal year. Projected operating expenditures for outer years include a 7% increase annual for labor ads and increases in wage and benefits. Materials and service costs include an increase of 4% per per year based on historical trending. And capital costs are based on the district's current five-year capital improvement plan. The solid blue line represents current year revenue by year. The current forecast for sanitary sewer and surface water management operations assumes reasonable and, and predictable increases of 4% annually. The dotted blue line represents the district's forecasted cash reserves at year end based on results of operations and shows a planned use of reserves in fiscal year 23 to fund capital projects. The current Financial forecast also includes a potential $100 million bond issuance in fiscal year 24 to help fund sanitary sewer capital projects. The timing of debt issuance will be contingent on system demands and the related sequencing and prioritization of planned project rollout. The debt issuance would increase current year revenues and related reserves in the year issued. The numbers at the top of each bar are the forecasted debt coverage ratios by year based on annual results of operations and ranged from 4.39 to 5.64 times debt service compared to the minimum required under current bond covenants of 1.2 times debt service. This forecast reflects the district's policy to maintain debt, debt coverage ratios above the minimum required by the existing bond covenants to maintain high bond ratings and lower cost future cost of issuance debt. The proposed budget and current financial forecast maintain strong metrics to fund adequate operating reserves to meet in inflationary impacts, provide rate stability, fund workforce resilience, fund the investment in capital infrastructure identified in the East and West Basin master plans and provide for the safety of dam and thermal compliance needs, fund asset renewal and expansion, and fund risk losses, including planning for subduction zone earthquake recovery. A comprehensive review of the district's rates and charges has not occurred since 2008, and the district does not have a formal reserve policy. The district's new strategy development and enterprise performance management group is working to secure the district's financial future, including the development of an updated long-term financial plan cost of service study and cost allocation plan and future rate development strategies for the district. The future proposed rates and financial forecasts will integrate work from this group. I would, at this time, I would like to introduce Jack Liang, our chief strategy officer, who will provide additional, an additional assessment of the district's reserve needs. Thank you, Kathy. Um, uh, if we can go back to the slide before, please. Um, thank you, Kathy. And as mentioned, my name is Jack Liang, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer. It's very nice to present to the member of the Budget Committee today. As Kathy mentioned, that uh, since I joined the district, I have been involved with the district's cost of service study, as well as a long-term financial planning. And as a part of that long-term financial planning, my financial strategy team has been partnering up with the finance staff in Kathy's team to look at the district's reserve um, as well as revenues and expenditures, and assess the reasonable uh, level in that. As Kathy mentioned, that while the district has not had a formalized reserve policy um, in the past, the district has really pr practiced very prudent financial management in terms of uh, keeping a healthy reserve for the district, as well as um, uh, uh, as well as controlling the district's expenditures uh, in a very reasonable level, and that is reflected in the district's very reasonable, very affordable rate increases of throughout history of the district. And while we're looking at the financial and the financial reserves, I wanted to point the member of the budget committee to page 88 of the budget document, the proposed budget document, where there is a detailed fund breakdown um, into each fund as well as the ending fund balance within each fund. As you can see that uh, on page 88 um, of the total reserve, the total ending fund balance for the district, which totals to about $304 million. Um, about $135 million of that are in some sort of special funds that are capital in nature or debt service in nature. 
So essentially, these are the reserves that are either restricted or assigned to a very specific purpose, um, either for debt service or a very um, or assigned to planned and known capital projects. The remainder of that is about 100, 170 million worth of um, ending fund balance that, re, that is budgeted in Fund 101, what we call the General Fund of Clean Water Services. And within that $170 million in our planning stage, we identified about 120 million of that are also for capital um, needs that's in nature. These are more for the unanticipated or unplanned uh, capital needs. I would like to mention that the, the current stage of the Scoggins Valley Dam projects, taking the option one, the dam safety project, we are anticipating that will cost the district about $50 million. And that is um, also planned for a part of that $120 million in the reserve capital that we have. The rest of that $120 million it's uh, really reserved for the unanticipated regulatory compliance changes, any growth or development within the within our service district, whether if it's a population growth or industry growth, as well as uh, in the event of a disaster or emergency disaster where we can recover quickly from a capital perspective um, in those situations. And besides that $120 million worth of uh, what we call capital uh, in nature in that uh, fund 101, we have about $50 million that is reserved for stabilizing our rate, as well as uh, handling any economic um, changes that, uh, that we can all continue to operate and deliver the service at the level that we deliver. And that amount is about $50 million uh, in that uh, fund 101. And uh, that is what we call our operating or um, rate stabilization reserve. And comparing that $50 million to our total resources, which amounts to about $375 million. And that is in between that 15 to 20% range within the general fund. And uh, in our initial review, we see that at a fairly reasonable level of operating reserve that uh, resides in fund 101. As I mentioned that our work is still underway and we are actually in the process of finalizing our cost of service study in the next few months, as well as building out a long-term financial plan for clean water services. A formalized reserve policy will also be developed and presented to the board for review and adoption um, when that is complete. At this stage, I wanted to share our uh, current status in reviewing the financial situation and the reserve and the clean water services uh, uh, ending fund balance as well as the reserve level seems to be adequate, but also reasonable uh, at this moment. I'll pass it back to Cassie. Thank you, Jack. Next slide, please. This slide demonstrates the district's commitment to rate stabilization. The blue line represents annual rate increases adopted by clean water services as compared to other local water utilities. Clean water services long-term rate strategy to keep rate increases reasonable and predictable has resulted in stable rates over time. As mentioned earlier, the deferral of rates in fiscal year 21 has a significant impact on future revenue generation for the district. The district also has significant capital project needs over the next five years. Um, you can refer to page 300 in your budget document for a list of, of the projects over that five year period. And even with these challenges, the district's able to maintain stable rate increases and avoid a spikes in rates to meet these capital investment needs. Next slide, please. With that, I'm turning this back over to Jack Liang. Thank you, Kathy. So we're going to switch the topic to look at our strategic planning uh, process within the district. And I would like to highlight that the entire process of our strategic planning as well as execution is consists of four components within the district. The first two components are the primary actions of strategic planning. Um, as you can see on the slide, the first portion is the strategic approach, which you have heard from us before. This is the system and the philosophy that guides the work of clean water services on a regular basis that is embedded in our operations. And um, that is the system and philosophy that actually helped the organization that lays out our mission, vision, value, as well as our promise to the community 
and it also summarizes all of that up into five key strategic outcomes that includes organizational excellence, integrated water resource management, and resilient watershed, um, research and innovation, in resource recovery, catalyzing transformational partnership, as well as contributing to the region's environmental and economic uh, vitality. So building up from that, what we have developed is a roadmap process, uh, as well as the framework internal to the organization. That's what we see as our strategy development process. So now the strategic approach provides the system and the philosophy, how do we achieve these outcomes? The work is in the roadmaps and uh, the planning work is in the roadmaps. We see the roadmaps as three level within the organization. There's a strategic and district wide level. Those are strategies and actions and metrics that actually goes across the district and really impact our operation across the district. Um, and then we have department level roadmaps that are more focused to a department within the district, as well as programs level of the roadmaps that are more focused toward each and individual programs within the departments. And from that strategy development, the implementation really lies within the district's operations and projects that goes on on a regular basis. And that touches every department, every program, every individual that's within um, the community of clean water services. And from that, we also have a, built out a monitoring and evaluation process, which consists of a performance dashboard that will tell us how we're doing based on the metrics that we identified in the roadmap process, as well as and presented to you in a previous um, meeting. This last fiscal year, what we have accomplished is we got a first version of the department roadmaps. And I want to highlight that the reason we call them first version is that we do recognize the constantly changing environment and challenges that we face as a um, utility district. And we see these documents as living documents that will continue to be updated and catered to the current challenge and the current environment that we're faced to. Um, essentially, our strategy may change from time to time uh, just based on what we're, what we're facing. And then there are also multiple strategic and program roadmaps that are underway and in process of being completed. We anticipate all program roadmaps will be completed in fiscal year 22, 23, and the multiple strategic and district-wide level roadmaps will be completed in the same fiscal year as well. Our other work in progress is also this performance dashboard. As mentioned before, this will tell us how we're doing against the metrics and the measures that we have identified. And this, will be completed in fiscal year 22, 23 as well. And we're looking forward to those work. So this is our current progress in the strategic planning process. Uh, next slide, please. So as we complete the department roadmaps, the first version of that, we have shared an electronic copy with each one of you. Um, and if you would like to see a paper copy, we'd be happy to forward a paper copy to you your address as well. So I just wanted to provide a high level overview of the components of this department roadmaps to help you in your review of um, our identified service levels, measures, as well as objectives and initiatives within the um, document. Starting in the document at the very top part portion of each department section, we actually included department overview. That is a high level introduction to what the department does and who the department is. And then we move into the service level section where we identify really the input, the output, and the challenges that we um, face, right? really the input, the output, and the challenges that we um, face um, as a department. Um, take, uh, for example, for the business services or uh, water resource uh, management, uh, water resource recovery department, you can see that uh, the amount of flow that we deal with on a regular basis, the kind of population base that we're serving. And so those are the the service level type of um, information that we include in the roadmaps. And then we move on to the effectiveness and efficiency measures where we identify certain measures that can tell us how well we're doing our job, both from an effectiveness perspective and an efficient perspective. And last but not least, we have identified objectives and initiatives. These are more action oriented, either projects or new initiatives that we're taking on that will help us improve our measures and continue to improve our performance at the department level, as well as contributing to the planning process um, that I have prepared. I'll stop here and uh, see if you have any questions.
if there is no questions, I'll pass it back to the chair of the budget committee to uh, move on to the public comment. Thank you, Diane, Kathy, and Jack. Uh, we, uh, at this point, welcome public comments on the overview. Uh, Clerk Moss, I believe we have a two minute limit on public comments. That is correct, Mr. Chair. So would any members of the public like, like to address the board of directors on any questions on this budget for up to two minutes for this section? I'll give you just a moment to utilize your raised hand. We are not seeing any hands, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Clerk Moss. Uh, with that, we'll move on to regional utility services. Can, can I ask a question? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having to navigate a different, uh, this is Roy Rogers, a different camera than I normally use. I, it, it, there's, there's something going crazy. I, I have maybe, maybe a view, Jack, or, or maybe more appropriate, Diane. Uh, the reserves are fairly high, and I, I appreciate you spending a bit of time indicating some of your future needs. But uh, uh, to a ratepayer, they you know they would look at this and find that you know the, the numbers look uh, like we we've, we've got a, a good bit of cash sitting around. And I know you got some East Basin issues. I know you've got some other things that uh, uh, with the expansion of uh, industry that you're going to have to do, but. Uh, is there an easy, quick summary that you might provide all of us uh, that would uh, kind of explain why we need these reserves? Yeah, we can definitely create a little more detailed list and uh, that uh, identify these reserves and the reason for these reserves uh, and share that with uh, the budget committee. Uh, this is uh, Diane. I really um, appreciate that question because we're always very mindful about what things are costing um, to our ratepayers, as well as making sure that we're creating a financial plan where we have enough reserves that we can dip into to pay for the increase in capital needs without having to um, seesaw the rates with spikes. So, Clerk Moss, can you go back to that slide of rate stabilization for me? Oh, the yeah, back, there we go. So when you have a utility does, that doesn't have adequate reserves, the only way that they can fund capital projects is through the issuance of large debt. And when you issue large debt, because of the covenants for uh, the coverage of your operating um, expense to cover debt that you need, you end up swinging your rate. So you can see an example with the uh, green rate that got swung from 4% all the way up to 16. They then needed, then they're able to recover the rate base to where it needs to be. So clean water services, by having these adequate reserves, we don't have to do that to our rate pairs. And that creates a lot of rate pair discontent when you have to build these capital projects, but you don't have adequate reserves, but you need to raise the rates to be able to, to meet the coverage requirements. So on one hand, it looks like we have excess, you could potentially say we have excessive reserves, but we don't because it's preventing those types of rate swings to our rate base. We were able to provide the rate relief that, um, the, that our uh, communities needed in 2021, but it came at a cost penalty of $62 million that was planned to be used for capital. So this team took it as a challenge to find at least $5 million worth of savings by resequencing things and holding um, some investments back. But we were able to do that because we have adequate reserves. So you see in 22, we had um, a rate increase. And now if you go back um, a couple of slides, you'll be able to see how we're bringing the rate down now in fiscal year uh, 23. And I'm, we're going to be seeing the, the rate normalize. So that's the reason that you have um, adequate reserves. One, to, to minimize rate spikes. Two, to ensure that you can weather um, um, storms like needing to provide some rate relief because of an economic situation, but dealing with inflation and dealing with um, unanticipated uh, projects that are needed to be able to support the economic um, vitality of the region. So all of those things combined, what 
our ratepayers can expect from clean water services is to be very practical and very pragmatic of how we're utilizing their money most efficiently so that they're not subjected to their family budgets of these unanticipated swings um, within um, our, for their utility rates. Um, one of the, we're at an inflection point. If you go back one more slide, Clerk Moss. Clerk Moss, could you go back a slide for me? So in this financial forecast, you see the fiscal year 23 budget. We have a choice. So we're assessing whether or not we should infuse some bond uh, money to be able to um, pay for some future projects. But we have a choice where we could actually potentially spend down reserves, but we need to make sure that we're in balance so that we can adequately um, fund the capital out of the uh, East Basin Master Plan. The East Basin area is where, or excuse me, the West Basin Master Plan area is where we do have significant um, activity in terms of economic activity with industries and other uh, development that's occurring. So we're wanting to make sure that all of this is in balance, but we will be coming to the budget committee next year with our final recommendation and working with our board on whether or not we could defer the bond issuance um, to future. So what will happen then with that dotted line by not issuing the bond, it will, uh, it will uh, decrease. So we're managing all of these things to be, um, to generate this result on the rate slide that you saw for rate stabilization. So um, I'm hoping, um, Director Rogers, I was able to um, answer that question and see if you have or other board members have, or budget committee members have follow-up questions. Uh, just to follow up, the, the, uh, I understand the, hydro the hydraulics of what you're talking about and operational as well as uh, future bond issues and, and rate stabilization. Um, is there a, a quick uh, a view we could have in regard to future capital improvements though that uh, uh, they look big, but you know our expenditures are big when we make some of these uh, future improvements. Is, is there some glimpse of the future that you're going to chat about? Or big yeah. items. Yeah. So we we don't have any prepared slides, but the budget committee, if you refer to pages 288 through um, 304, that outlines all of the very specific projects we're contemplating needs to be invested in the near term between now and uh, 2027. And the team is already forecasting um, the five years um, beyond that. So you'll see the, the sum total on page, let's see here. If I can slip. If you look on page 300, you'll see that the total um, capital that we're looking at is 487 million 581. So um, you can see that it would spend all of the reserves that, uh, <laughs> that we're planning for. So that's why we're, we're managing continually um, as we move forward. So that gives a little bit of forecasting of um, the, the money that's needed for the capital expenditures to meet the needs of the region. Can I help with any other questions um, budget committee members will have? This is a very important area um, that we are focusing and investing in, cost of services, financial forecasting, and rates. I have so, a question uh, about revenues. <clears throat> Do you have any idea how much of your revenue comes from single family residences compared to you know, apartment complexes, shopping centers, industries, et cetera? So if you look on, um, I'm trying to find the page. We, we don't break down right now um, the differential between residential and commercial. Um, the utility billing system upgrade that we're investing in with Walton Valley Water District because they do our billing for us is going to um, be able to provide that kind of management data. But when you look at what industry pays, it's roughly, Kathy, I would say a little over 10%. So 90% of the rate revenue comes yes. from 
are uh, residential and commercial. Is that correct, Kathy? Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you raise a really good question because um, in order to get the full picture, we would also need um, the data sets from our uh, partner cities. Um, and right now, um, our cost of services um, analysis team is working um, jointly with the cities to provide us all more uh, information. Okay. Thank you for the questions. Any others that we can we can help with? Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you, Diane. Okay. Uh, with that, we will move on to regional utility services. Go ahead. Actually, uh, Chair Song, uh, Kathy Leader's got the next couple, and then we'll introduce regional utility services. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair and Mark. <clears throat> next um, staff representing each of the operating programs for the district will present key service drivers impacting their 23 budget. Next slide, please. This slide provides a graphic representation of how the 96.3 million in operating labor and material and services is split between these service programs. Water resource recovery um, and business services are, are key program areas cost driving wise, um, followed by utility operations and services, regulatory affairs, natural systems, enterprise asset and technology services, and regional utility services. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to introduce Joe Gall, uh, our Chief Utility Relations Officer, who will discuss Regional Utility Services Program Budget. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning to the committee. And uh, I get to start with the first of the seven departmental uh, presentations. So Regional Utility Services, or RUSD as we call it, is one of our newer departments. We were created uh, approximately a year ago, along with EATS, which you'll hear later in our presentation. So we are a new department within CWS. Uh, in our presentation, I will cover uh, the budget overview and departmental overview. And then Andy Braun, our systems planning division manager, will talk about our increased efforts in city relations and an update on our ongoing IGA negotiations with both Hillsborough and Beaverton. Next slide, please. So these slides you will see for each of the departments. I wanted to highlight a couple uh, important uh, numbers on this slide. First, the FTE count. You'll see that it appears that the FTE count within RUSD is flat. 34 in the current budget to 34 in the proposed budget. I wanted to provide a little bit more context for that. So we are actually uh, proposing, there are three positions within RUSD Two, the integrated planning program is actually being shifted to the new strategy group, which is led by Jack Lang. And you'll hear about that later this morning. And then an admin position that is in the current year's budget is also being shifted to the new admin team within business services department. So in reality, we are proposing three new positions within the RUSD department. Uh, Kathy mentioned there's 13 total. There's three in our proposed budget. Two are additional plan review positions in development services. And the third position is a new planner within systems planning. The other item I want to note, you see a fairly significant decline in the materials and services line item there. That is largely professional services and contracts tied to integrated planning that, again, are being shifted to uh, the new strategy group. So I wanted to highlight those two numbers in this uh, budget overview. Next slide, please. So regional utility services, uh, there are two major divisions the Development Services Division and the Systems Planning Division. 
I want to touch on uh, these two important divisions within the department briefly this morning. I also want to highlight, uh, I mentioned that uh, this is a new department. I am in my position for uh, about a year now. I joined last June. And about a third of our staff within the 34 positions have joined regional use or CWS within the last two years. So as Diane said, as our organization is changing, that is certainly reflected in my department. We have about two thirds of our staff that are very seasoned and have been with us for many, many years. But we have a new infusion of new uh, staff coming into the department with new energy and new enthusiasm and new ideas, which is a very healthy mix, in my opinion, in terms of a team. So development services uh, is led by Damon Reishi. Damon, uh, as many of you know, has been with the district for nearly 20 years now, uh, brings a wealth of experience. He could not be here today, unfortunately. But the Development Services Division largely works with developers, homeowners, our cities and county partners on a variety of current development projects. And there are three major groups within Development Services. There is our Development Plan Review Team, which works on reviewing various development applications, environmental plan reviews uh, throughout the district. There is our inspecting group. So the inspectors that are out in the field inspecting the infrastructure that is being developed within the district, both uh, public projects and private development. And then our GIS team. Our GIS team works very closely with our partner cities to ensure as new infrastructure is being developed that our uh, GIS system is up to date and our asset management program is up to date. So those are the three major groups within development services. Systems planning division is managed by Andy Braun, another long-term CWS employee. Again, has been with the city or with the uh, district for nearly 20 years now. Together with our co-implementers, the system planning division plans, develops, coordinates, and manages the regional sanitary and stormwater capital improvement program, particularly those projects led by our partners. They assure compliance with our stormwater retrofit program, which is required by our NPDES permit and implemented by the district and our partners. Staff is responsible for identifying stormwater management opportunities and coordinating sanitary sewer system impacts on county transportation projects. We participate with local, county, regional, and statewide planners on various urban planning policies and projects. For example, we uh, currently have staff working on a variety of technical advisory committees for UGB expansion areas such as Beaverton uh, in terms of Cooper Mountain and King City. And I had mentioned we are proposing an additional planning position because we want to do more planning efforts and be uh, out front in terms of long range planning with our partner cities. We serve as a bridge between the overall sanitary and stormwater system master plan, system plan and how that plan is brought to fruition through both the development process and public capital project implementation. And the last item I want to note in terms of systems planning is that we coordinate and manage local improvement districts and reimbursement districts to provide public sewer service to unserved properties within our service area. I'd like to go to the next slide and then pass it on to Andy Braun, who's gonna do the second part of this departmental presentation. Okay, thank you, Joe. Good morning. Again, my name is Andy Braun, uh, Systems Planning Division Manager. The creation of the Regional Utility Services Department and the addition of Joe have greatly enhanced our relationship with our partners and new levels of their organizations. Through his firsthand experience in his prior role as Sherwood City Manager, Joe recognized the opportunity to expand the level of communication and engagement at our partners' highest levels. You, along with the city managers and all city elected officials, now receive Joe's monthly Call Gall newsletter, sharing activities and initiatives at Clean Water Services. 
We're more engaged than ever through broadened interaction with multiple city departments. The recently completed East Basin Master Plan and the West Basin Master Plan currently underway have offered opportunities to work more deeply with city planners, community and economic development staff, and finance officers, in addition to engineering and public works staff with whom we've maintained long and consistent relationships. Tours of, of Scoggins Dam and the Durham Treatment Plant to city managers and elected officials have heightened their depth of understanding and of the breadth of clean water services activities and community impact. Next slide, please. Recall that in May of 2021, you received notice from Hillsborough and Beaverton of their desire to renegotiate our operating agreements rather than renew the 2008 IGAs for another five-year term. We recognize that both cities have seen tremendous change since 2008. The IGA renewal period offers an opportunity to revisit and in some matters, redefine district and city roles as we move forward. As a member of the district's core team in these discussions, I've witnessed a genuine spirit of collaboration and partnering as we explore changes to further our collective mission. Through these meetings, which began with Hillsborough in October and with Beaverton in March, We've shared open and transparent dialogue regarding the background conditions and upcoming renewal of our watershed permit, regional and local roles and responsibilities, and the currently underway cost of service study, which will take a renewed look at regional and local user rates and system development charges. In the timeline shown, you'll see that we are currently transitioning from an educational phase to drafting new agreement language. We anticipate completing the rewrite of the IGA in the fall and bringing new agreements to you by the end of the calendar year. I hope this has provided some insight into the current activities of the new Regional Utility Services Department. Next slide, please. Joe and I are happy to entertain any questions you might have. So um, I, I have a better view. I can see people on screen here. I don't know if uh, the chair, chair song can, but I see your hands up, uh, Mr. Wilner. Uh, thanks, Andy and Joe. Uh, quick question about the systems planning department. So on CWAC, we've had some conversations about kind of in-basin planning for regional projects that can help alleviate individual stormwater facilities with new development. Is that work occurring within that systems planning group? Andy, since you're on the call and that's your division, do you want to take that question? Sure. Uh, we are certainly doing a lot of work with the sub-basin planning. It's really a multi-departmental effort. Um, the Development Services Group leads a lot of those design and construction standards. And along with the Natural Systems Enhancement and Stewardship Department, uh, we're really working together on these sub-basin master plans. Uh, which will address uh, regional approaches to stormwater management. So do you think that it, that investment will grow in the years to come? Very definitely. Um, you know, it's really just been in the last few years that we've really taken on a greater and greater look at these at the sub-basin uh, planning and really looking at it by by watershed. Uh, so we continue to uh, examine these. We're working very closely right now with Tigard and King City in uh, the expansion of the UGB areas there and what development and the stormwater management will handle there, um, as well as starting outreach with um, all of our member cities in how we go about implementing some of these regional approaches. Great. Thank you. Okay, not seeing any other questions. I think uh, we could go ahead and move to our regulatory affairs department. So I will ask that team to go ahead and step up. Thank you, Mark. Um, Chair Song, members of the committee, my name is Bob Baumgartner. I'm with the regulatory affairs group. Uh, and if you move to the next slide, please. 
With me is Jamie Hughes, who uh, Karen Chichetu and Joy Ramirez, who will talk a little bit more about the specific program areas. Uh, what I would like to do is touch real quickly on our budget overview, give you a description of what our program does uh, and provide a summary of our FTE changes. Next slide, please. As you can see within the budget we have, uh, last year we were at 35 FTE, or last year 36 FTE, excuse me. We've dropped that down one FTE. One of our uh, senior specialists or senior analysts has moved up into the uh, strategic strategy group that you heard about earlier to provide a crossover with the regulatory program uh, and help with some of the permitting and regulatory strategies going forward. I do want to touch a little bit on the increase associated with the materials and services. You can see that is about a 15% increase this year. There are a number of reasons for that increase. Uh, one of them uh, that we cannot control is a significant increase in our permitting fees from the state of Oregon for our NPDES permit. Another area where we are seeing significant increase in costs uh, related to our laboratory uh, and the equipment and chemical supplies for running that laboratory. Last year, we talked quite a bit about some of the analytical efforts that we were expanding and developing new analyses. Uh, this year, we are starting to implement those uh, in a production mode. An example of that would be the polyhydroxyl alkanoates, which is a nice term to use. I say that because Mark doesn't like me to say those high-tech terms, but they're little energy bundles of carbon that float around in our wastewater treatment plant. And managing those and understanding those are key to being able to make the biological nutrient removal work uh, that Logan is gonna talk about later. Uh, and that has been an increase in our cost, but it's been a huge uh, cost savings for Logan and his team for the chemical addition at uh, the plant that he will talk about. Similarly, we have developed methods for biological, uh, biologically available aluminum so that we can comply with the new standards developed by EPA for the state of Oregon uh, and are also looking at optimizing how we can manage our copper discharges into the river in order to both comply and save some of those uh, uh, chemical fees for removing copper. Beyond that, there has just been a significant increase in supply chain problems associated with uh, running a laboratory, both of the chemicals we use and the consumable equipment we use, such as the hand filters we use to measure uh, all of the metals. We have been paying a substantial amount of attention to this over the last couple months, and we really expect that we will be able to reduce what we anticipate as an increase, bring that down substantially from about a 15% increase to below a 10% increase. Um, and I expect that uh, we will be very effective or efficient in doing that. Next slide, please. Regulatory Affairs has three sub-programs. Those programs include our Compliance Service Program, our Environmental Services Program, and our laboratory that I have just talked about. We three are really an integrated program, and you'll hear more about these later, to provide services for the direct implementation components of uh, the district. We do provide, uh, or an example I wanted to provide was the one I just touched on with the chemical addition or the uh, developing methods for analyzing for the polyhydroxyl alkanoates that are used for the uh, biological phosphorus removal, the compliance services program. I mean, we are negotiating permits and negotiating limits for our plants, we worked with DEQ to make sure that we had the flexibility within our limits to implement the biological nutrient removal under a test case 
Uh, we are continuing that uh, and fully anticipating the next few years to formalize that as a final permit limit. Uh, the environmental services program doing the work to make sure the industrial discharges do not impair our program operations, as well as to identify and track down some of the new sources of pollutants, uh, such as what you may have heard about recently with the forever chemicals um, that have been in the news. And with that, the next slide, please. So with regulatory affairs, as the name implies, we are focused on the regulations, but a major part of our program is to plan for the future, have that vision for the future, uh, and what we are going to do to create those roadmaps so that we can not only remain in compliance, but to be in compliance uh, in now and into the future. A number of these issues Diane has touched on earlier with uh, the temperature and managing thermal loads. Uh, we are looking to preserve our growth and preserve our investment, investment in infrastructure, as well as making sure that we can uh, continue to operate our natural treatment system. With stormwater, we are looking to work with the regulatory agencies to create a regulatory process that allows us to integrate our stream uh, enhancement programs so that we can ensure that the streams in our area are resilient, both in the future for the anticipated impacts of climate change and how that is going to influence rainfall patterns, but also for the anticipated growth and intensity of urban development in our urban areas. Uh, we have been working with DEQ and recently received some very positive response to implement an integrated plan with them associated with our permit so that we don't have to wait for the next permit cycle to implement these programs or to strategize these programs and we'll be doing them as we go along. Right now we are in the cusp of developing our permit, working with our permit. A couple of key issues, as I mentioned, will be uh, maintaining the infrastructure and preparing for future growth and development. One of the key areas in that permit negotiation will be figuring out how to expand our reuse program that you'll hear about later. And with that, I will turn it over to Jamie Hughes. Thank you, Bob. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Hughes. I'm a water resources analyst in the Regulatory Affairs Department. And this year, as Bob mentioned, the Compliance Services Program is really focused on negotiations with DEQ on the district's watershed-based NPDES permit. And NPDES is our National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit. This is the permit that covers our four water resource recovery facilities and our stormwater program. Um, as Bob mentioned, we are working with DEQ to incorporate into the permit innovative regulatory practices, including watershed-based approaches, adaptive management, and integrated planning. The permit renewal process also includes working with all of our internal work groups to make sure that we can comply with the permit conditions. The Compliance Services Program is also responsible for negotiating and making sure we are in compliance with the district's air contaminant discharge permits for the Rock Creek and Durham treatment plants and two of our pump stations. So this work will enable the district to move away from the use of engine generator technology at our facilities and move towards the implementation of a renewable natural gas program. Over the last several years, the Compliance Services Program has really been working to be more efficient and effective with our regulatory reporting so that we can put more time and focus on ensuring compliance preparedness for the district. We track the development of state and federal regulations to help the district prepare for the increasingly complex regulatory requirements that are continuously coming our way. And part of this preparedness is working with DEQ and our partners to create regulatory pathways that will ensure we meet our permit requirements while also allowing us to pursue innovative programs and projects. Next slide, please. One of the regulatory pathways that the Compliance Services Group has been putting considerable time and effort into, and which will continue to be a focus area over the next several years, is partnering with DEQ to create a regulatory roadmap that will allow us to enhance our recycled water use program. 
to be able to apply, apply recycled water at our land application sites for the benefits of native plant growth and wetland enhancement. DEQ's reuse rules are currently very old and are written in a way that consider recycled water as a waste discharge. And we want to be able to work with DEQ to convince them to reevaluate their program and change many of their policies to view recycled water as more of a beneficial commodity. The district is paving this pathway in Oregon and to be successful, we're working to build a close partnership with DEQ. And we have also partnered with other public and private entities including the Oregon Association of Clean Water Agencies to gain feedback and support from utilities across the state, which will provide a firmer foundation for our negotiations with DEQ. And you'll be hearing more about the Recycled Water Use Program later on today. With that, I'll turn it over to Karen Chichetu to present the Laboratory Services Program. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Chichetu, a water quality lab manager. So this year we are seeing a substantial increase to our proposed uh, lab budget, particularly to the tech and scientific supplies. And um, this is due to the effects of inflation and supply, man, uh, supply chain management issues as been uh, mentioned earlier. And this is something that is not unique to the lab team. We've also uh, seen an increase in demand to analytical services from our customers within the district in the form of um, project requests. And as always, the lab continues to collaborate on projects with the research and innovation group. And all this combined um, results in um, increased samples that are coming to the lab. Um, and as a result, this impacts our consumable costs equipment uh, running costs, as well as FTE time. We are, however, continuing to take opportunities to reduce costs where we can by uh, working with vendors to uh, improve our purchasing system. And, um, and other ways that we are working to control costs is through our asset management program. Um, we have had good success with this. Um, particularly through proactively uh, managing our equipment replacements, um, managing our um, maintenance uh, program, as well as doing some of those um, maintenance in-house. We have also just recently introduced um, the maintenance uh, service contracts on high value equipment, and this has helped to control service uh, costs and repair costs on equipment by cutting down equipment downtime and reducing the costs that are associated with uh, taking um, some of the, our anal analytical samples to um, contract labs, which has been our um, backup for downed equipment. And so with this has been something that has seen costs adding up quickly when equipment are, da um, are down. And with that, I will hand over to Joy for the next slide. Thank you very much, Karen. So I just wanna share environmental services has successfully completed multiple foundational program updates over the last year. As we look to this coming year, we will be focusing on key strate strategic areas for industrial growth, partner collaboration, and how we're gonna be updating our procedures for water quality program response. As our service area continues to grow, we have new industries that are coming in and we have current industries that want to make changes to their discharges that come to our treatment plant facilities. Some of these discharges may need additional monitoring and evaluations, such as what are they made out, chemical composition, the volume and the rate of that discharge. As we look at these discharges all together, it will help us understand not only the needs of our customers, but the impacts or potential impacts to our recover resource recovery facilities. We really wanna put time in investing in this holistic approach to allow us to collaborate early on as these industries are coming in so we can understand what needs are going to be, um, need, what needs to be met for our customers. And this also allows us the opportunity to 
work with our treatment plants, work with our facilities to find out what the treatment process that's currently happening, what are the potential impacts? Could there be different uh, disruptions that could happen to those treatment plants? Or could there be issues within the collection system? And so we want to take this opportunity to get and collect additional information early on in this process with our industrial customers. Through this collaboration, we are really hoping that it'll help us develop more dynamic permits that include permit management plans for these industries, source control reductions, and pollution prevention measures. A few of those initiatives for pollution prevention, and I won't say the big word, I'll leave that to Bob, is PFAS. You know, we have, are we are currently and have been investing a lot of time in understanding what those sources of PFAS are, and also how do industrial sources impact reuse and the district's reuse efforts. And on top of the industrial portion, environmental services gets to engage with our customers and our, not only our industrial customers, but our residential customers for water quality. So we get a array of complaints that come in, and I'm not gonna say complaints, I'm gonna say concerns. You know, we get a call that somebody sees a neighbor dumping oil or paint into a catch basin that could impact the stormwater. And so how do we improve those responses and go forth with educating and looking for opportunities there? And in light of our permit renewal that Jamie had mentioned, we are anticipating some additional changes on the MS4 side. So we have taken that as an opportunity to streamline our st and standardize our follow-up for those calls that we receive, how to respond, how do we know how to tie that loop to make sure we're not only engaging our customers and taking that as an educational opportunity, but meeting our regulatory requirements. And the other side of that is our internal customer concerns. Again, don't want to say complaints, but concerns. What our treatment plants see and how those they see disruptions and how we can go forward with our industries to find out, is there any of these disruptions that may not cause an upset or a, a permit violation, which we definitely wanna make sure does not happen. But when we start understanding the chemistry of these waste streams on our resource um, recovery facilities, we can provide that better customer service to our, our own internal customers. Next slide, please. And that's what we had for regulatory affairs. Are there any questions? I have one, Bob. Oh, please. On the, uh, the supply chain issues, are those things that are you think are likely going to work themselves out or is this gonna be an ongoing issue? And if it is an ongoing issue, are you gonna work with other your peers around the country to do something to start producing those things you need yourselves rather than rather than uh, being at the mercy of some somewhere somebody somewhere outside the country maybe yeah you know mike that's that's a great question and i think uh it's a little bit of a mix of both of them uh one example uh that i'll use is we actually have these filters that we have to use, as I said, for the metals. Those happen to be the same kind of filters that people are using for the, uh, you know, understanding COVID or doing some of the COVID testing. So there became a big demand for them and the supply dried up. So they became very expensive. Now that some of the uh, pandemic seems to be waning, at least to some extent, I expect that supply line will or supply will increase. Uh, the other thing that we've noticed, uh, and we being in this case, Karen, is that some of our state contracting, where we've all contracted together, uh, contracted at a pretty high rate. And so we're moving off to do some of our own uh, supply line analysis to see if we can get them, get what we need a little bit less expensively. Uh, and we are also looking at different uh, vendors to see if they can provide equipment that will do what we need, testing that. And so I think it's already happening where some of the vendors uh, locally are trying to figure out how they can insert themselves into that supply chain. Um, that help, Mike? That sounds good. I would, I would just hope that 
you don't rely on too much going back to normal because we'll we'll go through this again, I'm pretty sure. So, you know, be thinking ahead on what are you going to do next time? Uh, that's that's a really good point. And we have uh, learned a lesson about making sure that we have our adequate stockpiles to get us through for a while as well. Good. So thank you, Mr. McKillop. Um, Bob, I want you to be aware there's a number of hands up. So I'm going to go ahead and call on those. So I'll start with uh, Chair Harrington. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoy the Clean Water Services Budget Committee uh, meeting because I learned so very much. Thank you for bringing your work to life. I have uh, two particular questions and hopefully I will be pronouncing your names correctly. Um, Jamie, I think you're off the hook for questions or uh, Jamie Hughes, Ms. Hughes, sorry. Um, Ms. Chechu, Karen, did I pronounce that correctly? You tried. <laughs> Could you please help me do better? It's Chichetu. Chichetu, yeah. thank you. So um, I'm not a scientific person. Oh, boy, am I grateful for all of you experts. Uh, so I'm looking on page 202 of the budget document. And I noticed uh, in the last paragraph on this page, um, third line from the bottom, method for total, some kind of complex word, nitrogen. And I was wondering, I don't know what that word is. Um, I was wondering what it is about that particular kind of nitrogen uh, that, um, that is special. Bob, can you help me out? I don't have the document uh, in front of me. Yeah, it's Keljol nitrogen, and that helps us understand how much of the nitrogen is bound up uh, in organic material, such as the dead bacteria cells that may come out with suspended solids. It's important for understanding the potential influence on algal growth in the river. Oh, oh it's, it's the TKN. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, then on slide 41, uh, Ms. Ramirez, did I get that pronunciation right? Hopefully. Um, I was wondering, um, in, on page 201, it talks about how the program acts as DEQ's agent for the 1200Z NPDES industrial stormwater permitting and compliance programs and implements the commercial and industrial stormwater programs. It's like, oh, wow. So this, so learning here for me this year, it isn't just about uh, the industrial wastewater. Real learning here for me. You also have to take care of the permitting for industrial stormwater, right? Yes, that is correct. Uh, we, we are an agent for DEQ's um, general stormwater permit. And so a lot of our industries fall under that um, general code that requires them to be in that permit. And so we get to uh, go out and tromp around in the rain and look at these facilities to see what their potential impact could be to not to our MS4 also. So it, does this mean no matter where those industries are located, whether they're in cities or in the urban unincorporated area, because of the nature of, of the size of those industrial facilities, you folks are on the hook for doing that too. So we are on the hook for that within our service area. So within our boundaries, we do any industrial discharge on behalf of DEQ okay. for the stormwater side. Okay. Thank you very much. Learn something Thank new every, every day, every year. Thank you. Good. Um, next, I see the hand up by Lori Haynes. 
Hey, thank you, Mr. Jockers. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have kind of a similar question um, to Mr. McKillop about uh, the chemicals. Uh, now, I assume that uh, some of these costs will go back down um, as uh, we get a better supply and also as we no longer presumably have to monitor for COVID. So um, I have a fair amount of faith that's been earned by clean water services over many years, uh, but I still feel compelled to say it's so easy to have numbers go up have your costs reduced after the fact and not bring those numbers back down. So um, I, I uh, just wanted to hope that we track on that. Thank you. And Lori, we will. We will track on that and we will bring them down. So um, looking at the committee, Mike, uh, Mr. McKelp, you still have your hand up. I'm assuming we've answered that question and uh, as well as you. Uh, if there aren't other questions. I will hand it back to uh, Chair Song for what we should do next. Great. Thank you, Mark. So we've come to what was scheduled for our first break. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, but we will take our 15 minute break, uh, reconvene at 1050. And just to let everyone know, we may push back lunch a little bit to accommodate our schedule adjustment. So with that, I think we'll reconvene at 1050. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. And we will see people back here in 15 minutes.
Budget Committee members, are you back with us? We are. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mark. Okay, uh, we will continue with our department uh, presentations with water resource recovery operations and services. Chair so, Song, Commissioner Treese had a question. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Chair Song. <laughs> I, I just wanted to give a shout out to the whole team for the glossary at the back. I, you know, I always enjoy that, but man, it's really good this time. And, you know, it, reading that helps me remember all sorts of different things. So I just wanted to tell you what a great job you did and how, how complete it is. So thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner Trees. Good morning and uh, welcome uh, board and budget committee members to the water resource recovery operations and services budget overview. Really pleased to be here speaking with you this morning. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my name is Logan Olds. I'm the water resource recovery services manager. I'm gonna be giving you a general budget overview followed by a discussion about one of the most annoying problems we've had this year, uh, chemicals. Following me will be Mr. Rick Shanley, the treatment plant services manager, and he's gonna be discussing some really great projects uh, occurring in the upcoming year and years in reuse. Next slide. Uh, as you can see, I think the most interesting number that we have to present to you this year is the 3% increase in materials and services budget. Uh, three quarters of that 3% is related to issues associated with purchasing, acquiring, transporting uh, chemicals for our facilities. Uh, we do have one new position that's proposed going from 123 to 124, and that's to improve an operational reliability issue we have at our facilities. And uh, we're simply looking forward to hopefully having a stable fiscal year 23 as opposed to fiscal year 21 and 22. Next slide, please. Uh, we're basically broken into four groups. Uh, you can see biosolids reuse in Fernhill. So I like to think of that as our natural systems and biosolids group. Uh, the next four relate to the operations and maintenance of not only our facilities, but also our pump stations. And then finally, we have treatment plant engineering services that helps ensure that we have the infrastructure we need to do uh, what we do. And finally, a group we heavily rely on, technology development and research, which truly helps us understand not only how our facilities are functioning currently, but also as we evaluate ideas to improve the efficiency or the effectiveness of our operations how we can do that in a manner that is consistent with past practice and regulatory needs. Uh, next slide. Now, everyone seems to forget about this, but um, we had a hurricane which began uh, our supply chain issues in 2019. Uh, the facilities associated with that hurricane are still uh, not operational. We then went into the pandemic in 2020, associated labor shortages resulting in issues with not only raw materials, uh, but also with manufacturing, trucking, and rail transport. And then finally, 2022, we've had the joys of inflation. So realistically, when you see a net increase of 6%, despite all of those challenges that we've had over the last four years, I think you should be pretty pleased. This has been exemplified in a uh, consent agenda item that the board approved on May 3rd. Uh, it related to one of the chemicals that we use quite a bit of. But what you'll notice in that consent item agenda is that we actively manage these contracts. First off, it actually mentioned a reduction in the cost because we track an index. By tracking to an index, when we expect there to be changes to the cost of that chemical, if it's reduced, we can take advantage of that. And currently we believe based on market trends and again, watching those facilities that are coming back online, that we do have the opportunity to benefit from what we believe will be a reduction. Uh, also as part of that item, 
you saw that we are requesting additional funds. And again, that's just because of all of these myriad of issues that you see that we have been working through since 2019. So I think the key concept here is again, even though we focus on the efficiency and effectiveness of our operations on a day-to-day -day basis, there is still the opportunity to actively manage our costs as one of the committee members mentioned earlier. You see the increases, but yet how do we also ensure that we take advantage of the reductions? Next slide. Now, this is pretty interesting. I'm not sure who all likes to look at these types of things, but I do. I think it's kind of fun, uh, except for when you see lines like this. So the Federal Reserve economic data has a ton of different information that we can use to understand what type of market conditions are we facing. And these are two of the most extreme that I have seen. One is for chlorine. Of course, we use chlorine for disinfection. Uh, sulfuric acid we use to help with uh, nutrient recovery. But you can see that the cost was relatively stable until roughly January of 2021 for both of these, when we started experiencing exponential increases. And this was largely due to uh, a nut, the, each of the issues I mentioned in the prior slide but also these issues then compounded and resulted in uh, a couple of emergency orders that the board was aware of, resulting in uh, increased costs, uh, transportation issues, and simply obtaining the chemical became a really big problem. Next slide. Now, fortunately, uh, you know, I always love Bob and his team, Bob, Karen, Jamie, Joy, uh, Peter and his, Rick and his teams, uh, because realistically, we don't do this in a silo. Uh, if it weren't for their consistent support and, and just help when we face these challenges, I can only imagine where we would be today. So I, I just wanted to take a moment to thank them uh, for working together as a team. Uh, you, it mentions regulatory here. Since 2019, we have had a reduction in our chemical costs. And you can see 4.3 million 2019 down to roughly 4.3 million is what we're projecting in 2023. And you would say, well, wait a minute, it's roughly the same dollar value. In actuality, you can see that we've had significant reductions. And what we're actually facing are, again, challenges in those supply chain issues that are leading to these increased costs. Uh, one of the great aspects of working together as a team is when regulatory informs us that there will be changes, we can automatically begin evaluating how those changes will impact our operations so that we can reduce our costs appropriately or if they will lead to an increase in costs. Uh, one of the benefits that the, the district has received is the support by the board for the creation of the superintendents and operations analyst positions. So you noticed a, a common term that's been used throughout the presentation about the efficiency and effectiveness of our departments as a whole, but then as the district overall. This is one area that showed a lot of foresight because we now have folks that are dedicated at each of our sites to purely focus on what can we do better day to day, whether it's big or small, and how do they interact with folks from regulatory, engineering, technology, uh, to ensure that we are staying roughly 75% of the materials and services budget increase is due to these fluctuations in uh, costs associated with chemicals. However, we have experienced a 48% net reduction in the chemical cost for, for alum. So that's not only are we using less, but despite the increased cost of alum, we are still at that 50% level. So I think that shows, uh, and I forget which board member made the comment earlier or committee member, but that does show that we are taking advantage when possible of reductions in market conditions. And with that, I believe I will be turning it over to Mr. Rick Shanley to talk about uh, reuse projects. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Logan. Well, it's tough to pick one thing to talk about. Uh, within treatment plant services. There's lots of opportunities out there, but hopefully as I run through these slides, you'll quickly grasp why reuse is the sort of the obvious choice for this year. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on current state and where we're at. We do have a good program, but it's very important that we recognize we need a vision for the future and the future state of our reuse program has to grow for a variety of reasons, and I'll get into those. Some of the key things, and there's really three um, that I would like to talk about with respect to where we got to go. And one is getting water providers 
on board with reuse and viewing it as a benefit and not so much as a threat to you know rates that that might receive, but more more with respect to resiliency of their system and really for for cost and other uh, benefits to the community as a whole. So that's a key piece of work that needs to happen. Um, and that's where Joe Gall and Andy are gonna be very supportive in, in that particular role. We do wanna restore wetlands and provide additional free stream flow to those. And Jamie touched upon the need for regulatory advancement and movement to make that important piece happen. The other part is growing our agricultural base. We've got a great opportunity. Um, one example is with the Tualatin Valley Irrigation District to send them a whole bunch of water um, so that their users could, could take advantage of that water and leave you know, potentially up to 10 million gallons a day of water in the river that currently gets removed for agricultural uses. Again, there are regulatory pieces that need to happen, um, but having a vision is, is, is critical to moving ourselves in the right direction. And I think, I think we're definitely as a, as a district moving uh, and making great strides. Next slide, please. So the history, um, there's a lot of it. It was surprising to me that um, reuse began back in 1990. That's a very early adoption. Um, and it's been a great, a, a great program. We need to build upon that. And one of the things we did to help is the pure water brew process. So reuse is, is great, is, but you have to have demand and you have to have people that want the water. And so pure water brew, as we all know, I think it exceeded many, many people's expectations in helping to promote that concept of one water and getting people to really understand the value of the water that we use. Uh, so today we're really driven in large part by regulatory strategy. So not doing the dam raise is, is great for the budget. We're gonna save a lot of money, but that was a key component to thermal management. So we've got a goal. Um, I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna get there a little bit later, but five and 25 is our slogan. Um, and we'd like to talk about some of those projects and how we're gonna do that before we wrap up. Next slide, please. So just this points out where we're at today. Again, the, the key takeaways here are, it's all around the Durham facility, it's all in Tigard, and it's very much an urban focused program. Um, the other point is we produce class A recycled water. So there's various classes. Class A is the highest level of treatment you can get. And for applications in urban centers and golf courses, you really need that. For a long time, our, our strategy was we're gonna focus just on class A. We really changed our um, strategy a bit. And so now we're looking to more do fit for purpose water. So there's places that are remote that aren't using food crops where class C water makes a whole bunch of sense rather and it's just as safe for what you're doing, um, but it saves us a lot of money in chemicals and other things as Logan pointed out, we got a lot of pressures in those areas. So I, I wanna mention that we're using and we're growing our, our philosophy a little bit to meet some of the different demands that are out there and, and do it cost effectively. Next slide, please. So temperature compliance and cost savings, those two bubbles, we're gonna keep talking about those over and over again. I mean, this is the cornerstone of how we're gonna to get to compliance, but as others have mentioned, there's a whole bunch of other things that come along for the ride, protecting habitat, restoring natural resources, watershed protection, saving on potable water, huge benefits to the community. The one that I really like to point out here though is the climate impact and resilience piece. So we've all seen how quickly climate change is, is happening. Um, and sometimes I'm overwhelmed. What can we really be doing today to set us up? Because there's a lot of uncertainty about you know, what, what some of those extremes are gonna be. To me, reuse is a great strategy that provides a whole bunch of benefit and a lot of flexibility in positioning us to be adapting towards the climate change and some of those severe droughts and things that are gonna happen. Next slide, please. So our objectives, keep thermal energy out of the river, um, urban, retail, wholesale. We have a good program there. Um, we'll continue to build on that area. But what we don't really have today is a huge amount of agricultural use. And what's beautiful about that is, again, if you can keep that water in the river from some of the ag users, um, 
and give them our water instead. It's really the greatest bang for the buck with the recycled water program. So a lot of our focus is moving into ag, ag use. Again, environmental, fit for purpose water. We get the second great uh, benefit of having wetlands west restoration, which is real core to our, our, our vision and our mission. Next slide, please. So future projects, this is the, this should be the five and 25. This is where we're heading and we're in really good shape. I'm happy to say. So Davis uh, tool, Jackson bottom, we have a lot of infrastructure, but we do need to add more irrigation infrastructure. We've done a lot of evaluation on the best and most cost-effective way to make that happen. And our plan is to have that in place for summer of 2024. Uh, the reserve golf course is moving at an even quicker pace. So we are about 30% complete with the design of the pipeline that's going to convey uh, water to the reserve. And it's a very significant amount of water. We're looking at approximately 1.5 million gallons a day. So that's a huge expansion and benefit to our program and moving us more into the West Basin um, where we see a lot more uh, demands of different varieties. And then the other piece to hit the five is Fernhill Properties. And again, in, in focusing a little bit more on fit for purpose water, there's a lot we can do with the existing infrastructure. We need a little help from Bob and, and the Regulatory Affairs Group to make a few of those things happen, but we've had great discussions and we feel very optimistic that that also is going to be in place uh, definitely in time for our, our projected uh, and hit our, we won't have to change our slogan. It's going to be five and 25. We're sticking to it. Um, and we're excited to get that done. Next slide, please. That is the end of our presentation for our department. So we're open to uh, any questions. So I do not see any questions here. Um, so, Mark, I think you have Mike with his hand up. Oh, okay. Thank you for seeing that. Uh, I've somewhere in one of these documents or pages, I read something about the uh, Merriweather Golf Course. Is that going to turn into a, a reuse water uh, site, or is that something different? Well, I'll take the first cut, but I'm guessing Diane and Nate might want to expand more on that because there's a whole host of opportunities with, with that property, but definitely reuse is, is one of them. And there's a lot of acreage there. And I will say from uh, the treatment plant perspective, we are positioning ourselves to have the infrastructure available. And we know exactly how we're going to use the pipeline that's carrying water to the reserve to get uh, water over to the Merriweather spot. And I'm very hopeful that will happen. But Nate or Diane, do you want to talk any more about the bigger vision for, for Merriweather? Sure, I can. This is Nate. Uh, I can briefly uh, add to that. It is a candidate location. We're currently investigating the opportunity to see if we can purchase that and add that to our acreage for recycled water. And if we do that, it would be between one and a half to two million gallons a day that we could add to the program. So we're currently in the uh, exploration phase of that project right now. Would it stay as a golf course or would it become more of a wetlands kind of uh, application? But there's, the, the, if you're familiar with the golf course, there's a low land and there's a higher ground. So the lower land is the part we're most interested in purchasing it for because we can do that as a, both connect, connectivity to the river and do recycled water down there. What happens to the uplands is uh, more, more opportunities to explore for that. But the lowland is where we're really looking at the advantage for our program. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mike, I, I will also add, if, you, if you're familiar with that property, it's about 350 acres and 220 of them are within the floodplain. I think it's one of the reasons why they're getting out of the golf course business a little bit, but that, that provides the opportunity for us, certainly. Okay, other, qu other questions from we'll toggle through faces here? Okay, back to you, share song. I was muted. 
Uh, next up, utility operations and services. Thanks. Good morning. I'm John Doomer, and I'm representing the Utility and Operations and Services Department, where I am the Conveyance Engineering Division Manager. Our department is responsible for planning, design, construction, oversight, and operation and maintenance of our surface water and sanitary conveyance systems. Some of that work is illustrated in these action photos of pipeline television inspection and pipeline construction. Next slide. Today, I'll be discussing the budget and overview and staffing. And here with me to highlight some of our utility operations and services work are Wade Denny and Ryan Sandu. Wade is a conveyance engineering principal engineer. He'll be sharing information on the Cedar Mill Creek sanitary and stormwater management project, which is currently under construction. And Ryan is field operations division manager and he'll be sharing information about our fleet program. Next slide. The fiscal year 2023 proposed total departmental budget for utility operations and services is just under $13 million with both personnel services and materials and services having slight decreases from last year. The budget is reflective of a net reduction of two full-time equivalents moving from 94 in fiscal year 2022 to 92 proposed for fiscal year 2023. That change in full-time equivalents includes three transferring to our new centralized administrative services program in the business services department and also reflects the addition of one new field construction superintendent position in the field operations division. Next slide. The utility operations and services department is organized into three groups. Field operations, which is responsible for maintaining the storm and sanitary collection systems. And those are the folks that you see, likely see, uh, throughout the district that sweep the streets, clean catch basins, inspect pipes, maintain water quality facilities and repair damaged or deteriorated infrastructure. Working a little more behind the scenes as engineers tend to like to do on the details is our conveyance engineering group, which is responsible for planning, design and construction administration for the sanitary and stormwater collection systems. The third group is administration, which is responsible for overall management policy development within the department, as well as fleet services and communicating and coordinating between departments. Together, we are responsible for the storm and sanitary collection systems. Now Wade is going to highlight one of our projects currently under construction. Wade, next slide. Yeah, thank you, John. I'm Wade Denny. I'm a principal engineer in the utility operations department. And I'm here today, I'm really happy to talk about our Cedar Mill project. Um, this project that we've been working on in our conveyance engineering group really touches on a number of our budget drivers. Um, the specific drivers as related to growth, asset management, and regulation, and this also contributes to each of Clean Water Services' key strategic outcomes. And this project is, is, has been a really fun one to work on. As part of our planning work for this project, um, we investigate um, development impacts on the conveyance system in conjunction with managing the aging infrastructure that is in place. As a result of this planning work, the 47-year-old Cedar Mill trunk was identified as a piece of infrastructure that would soon need to be replaced to convey future sanitary flows and to replace an asset which is near the end of its, its useful life. This project involved the upsizing of 4,900 linear feet of the capacity limited Cedar Mill trunk from 36 to 48 inches in diameter across the Twalton Hills Nature Park in Beaverton. This project also offered an opportunity to partner with Washington County to address a regulatory need that they had on one of their nearby projects. This instance allowed us to leverage the infrastructure project to restore the Cedar Mill Creek corridor through the Twalton Hills Nature Park and in doing so, help address the county's regulatory need. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. An um, integrated project approach was used to develop and deliver this project. This approach allowed leveraging the collective knowledge of subject matter experts across clean water services as the project was developed. 
This approach contributed to our continued effort to strive for excellence within our organization. In using this integrated approach, we were able to transform what began as an infrastructure project into a multi-outcome project that benefited both the conveyance infrastructure as well as the natural resources. This approach has allowed CWS to work with regulatory agencies to focus on stream resiliency in areas impacted by construction, rather than simply relying on existing prescriptive methods to address the area of impact. Another strategic approach used on this project was the utilization of construction manager slash general contractor contracting for project delivery. This contracting methodology has only been employed at a limited basis here at CWS, but has allowed CWS to bring a contractor on board early to use their expertise to assist with the completion of design. The integrated approach relied heavily on building on existing and developing new partnerships with regulators and stakeholders. We really had to get all the right pieces together and get the lineup adjusted to put ourselves in a position to be successful for this project. Next slide, please. There are several unique features associated with this project. As previously mentioned, it is being built through Tualatin's flagship nature park, and we've managed to keep the park open during this time. Uh, this has really required close coordination with our stakeholders, as well as our contractor, really getting up close and personal with the two and four-legged inhabitants of the, of the nature park. The project itself includes two trenchless pipe installations. These trenchless installations were successfully installed during uh, last fall. And there are also three creek crossing locations where we have to reroute the creek in order to, to install the pipeline. Another unique element with this project are the existing boardwalks within the park that are really a vital part of this trail system. Some of these boardwalks are being replaced as part of the project in a manner that allows portions of the trail to remain in place during construction. And the final unique element in this project is that the majority of the work is, is being performed within a wetland or waterway. This has really required our team to create a really unique construction schedule to really limit our areas of impact during the wetter times of the year to avoid the flooding issues on the work sites. And though becoming less unique to us, as previously mentioned, the project was delivered in an integrated fashion with a focus on coordinating with stakeholders and regulators. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to give you a brief update on project status. With regards to schedule, the first construction season took place last summer and fall, and we were able to complete all the elements of the work that were associated with those construction seasons. The second phase of construction is underway and the project is on schedule. And we look forward to wrapping up this project in the fall of 2022. Pipe installation is scheduled to be completed later this summer, and then we'll follow that up with restoration within the nature park. The project is on budget, and we initially set a $15 million budget for this project. Now I'm going to be turning this presentation over to Ryan Sandu, our Field Operations Division Manager, who will share more about the work being done by that group. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Wade. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all today. Uh, as John introduced on the earlier slide, I'm Ryan Sandu, the Field Operations Division Manager. Uh, the District Fleet Program is housed within Field Ops, and that's what I'd like to talk with you a little bit about today. You can see on the slide here a couple stats on our, our fleet program. Uh, across the district, we track 215 fleet assets within our enterprise asset management system with a replacement value of just under $14 million. Our fleet includes everything from an electric Chevy Volt, half-ton pickups, dump trucks, excavators, and specialized sewer maintenance equipment such as TV vans and factory trucks. Before I talk about our fleet capital program, I wanted to mention that our fleet expenditures are budgeted in both operating and capital budgets. All operating programs that are assigned vehicles have a fleet repair and a fleet fuel line item within the, that program's operating budget. So there will be costs that you'll see in the operating side. Um, capital expenditures are included in the capital improvement program as projects. That includes replacement purchases identified through our asset management process and additional or new vehicles needed to support new staff or tasks. For FY23, we are proposing fleet CIP expenditures of 1.9 million this includes between 11 and 13 carryover vehicles that were budgeted in FY22, but we will not be able to procure in FY22 due to supply chain issues that I'll talk about a little more on the next slide. We also have four ads, uh, or I'm sorry, four replacements that we're looking for in FY23 and three ads. Uh, one aspect of F FY23 that we're really excited about is the possibility of adding our first electric half ton pickup truck to our fleet. So a half ton would be like an F-150 or a Chevy Silverado. Uh, something we've been waiting for, and with uh, some of the large uh, manufacturers in the uh, U.S. coming out with electric pickups, uh, is something we're, we're hoping to be able to procure and add to our fleet. 
Uh, for context, we currently have three electric passenger vehicles in our fleet. Uh, we're definitely looking uh, to increase the EV, EV vehicles uh, in the coming years uh, for both our light duty and our heavy duty fleet assets as well. Next slide, please. As you heard earlier from Karen and Logan, supply chain issues are unfortunately a continuing theme and one that has a major impact on our FY22 uh, fleet procurement. Uh, as I mentioned, we're only expecting to procure between four to six vehicles out of the 17 that were approved in the FY22 CIP budget. This is very unusual. Over the past 10 years, we occasionally have one vehicle that might be carried over to the next budget year due to a production delay or delivery day. But in a normal year, we expect to deliver 100% of the planned uh, fleet replacements or ads. So to only procure 25 to 33% of our planned purchases is really unprecedented. And the reason I use the word expected to spend or expected to procure here on this slide is that vehicle procurement has been and continues to be a moving target. In fact, it's changed two or three times just since we've uh, put these slides together in the last uh, few weeks and, and months here. Uh, for example, in the fall, we issued POs for uh, four Chevy Silverados, uh, only to be notified a month or so later that the production line was shut down and the POs were canceled and I didn't know when, when they'd be restarting the next model year. And that's been kind of, a, that's been the theme of FY22 really for fleet. Due to the fluctuations and unpredictable situation with the industry, we're finding that our public fleet vendors are reluctant or even unable to provide quotes and are uncertain about when order banks will open or production lines will start up. Uh, fleet procurement is typically a very structured, very predictable process from start to finish. So the current situation really has everyone uh, in the industry kind of off balance. Well, this is definitely a concern for this year in FY23. It doesn't appear to be returning to normal anytime soon. And I believe uh, Mr. McKillop asked the question on this related to some of the other uh, supply chain issues. And what we're hearing, Mike, is that for fleet, this is going to be at least a couple of years before the uh, fleet procurement smooths out. So I do expect we'll be talking with you about this again next year and possibly even into a following year uh, or more. Next slide, please. We are actively managing to work uh, uh, to, so, to manage these supply chain challenges and, and making adjustments in our long-term fleet uh, costs uh, um, as needed. For example, in the, the top bar chart shows what uh, our expenditures would have been without any adjustments, uh, quite a bit over our red line of, of our target 1.5 million per year uh, fleet expenditures. Um, our fleet manager, Steve McNeil, working closely with our program supervisors, rebalanced our expenditures over the next three to five years, uh, which is depicted in the lower chart there. And again, this is something that we're going to be expecting that, that we'll have to do again next year and then for the next few years so that we can keep a, a balanced, predictable fleet expenditure from year to year, which is our goal. Uh, just took a little bit of extra attention and time this year to try to, to balance that out over the next uh, few years. Next slide, please. All right, we're happy to answer any uh, questions about the UOPS budget uh, at this time. You have questions from two people. Let's see, I think, I'm sorry, I can't see everybody on the list. Oh, yeah, Lori, go, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, this question is for Mr. Denny. Uh, regarding the Cedar Mill Creek project. Um, and I'm interested in what happens with wildlife out there. And specifically my questions were, uh, are what do you, when you said you worked with wildlife, I'd like to know what that means. Um, for example, uh, in the park behind my house this weekend, there were trees being cut and it's bird season. Uh, and rerouting the streams, whether you did wildlife and fish sal uh, salvage, uh, and then just one other question after that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, as far as wildlife goes, yeah, the nature park's full of wildlife. There's a lot of deer that are in abundance in the park, and those have been pretty active um, construction site visitors to our project areas. And during construction, we've taken kind of added precautions to ensure there's adequate spacing in our exclusion fencing to ensure that you know wildlife can pass through the project area and they're not limited to being within it or with outside the project area. Another thing that we've done um, associated with some of the wildlife within the creek is when we when we build these projects, we have to permit them. As part of the permitting requirements, we have to do what's called a, a salvage, a fish salvage. It sounds like you may be aware of that. But 
as part of this project, we had to salvage the creek crossings prior to um, completing them and, and, and progression with the project. Um, a couple of the other things in regards to birds, um, we started to do an early flushing within the park to help ensure that the birds weren't going to be nesting within the project area that we're going to be impacting. So this helped ensure that we were able to cut the trees without having you know, active birds within those trees nesting and, 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 and creating you know, offspring. Hope that answered your question. It did, thank you. Um, and then my other completely separate, more general question is, I'm wondering if Clean Water Services is doing any work to diversify its contractors. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Hennings, I will take that uh, question. It's a good question because we'll be talking about that a little bit in the business services for, for this new culture, equity, and learning group. Um, we're looking from an equity standpoint at four primary areas that we are trying to build metrics around and change. One of them is related to procurement. And what we've really done there is started to look at where we currently spend our money and then where are we spending money with, uh, with COVID um, firms, with uh, women, minority, uh, small business owners, so we can get an idea of what, what levers and what buttons can we push to, to make that movement there. And we certainly recognize that need. Uh, Lori, is, did that answer your question? It did, thank you. Great, thank you. So I have a fleet question for Ryan. Uh, thanks for the update on electrification. I was wondering, what are your thoughts on the future for your heavy vehicles as alternative fuels, fuel cells, uh, uh, yes, thank you for that question. It's it's definitely something um, that our, our fleet manager uh, Steve McNeil um, is very interested in, and and I am as well. Um, and I'm always somewhat surprised that uh, we're seeing a fair amount of um, alternative uh, fueled vehicles um, right now. Uh, it sounds like it's primarily for for the heavy vehicles. It's primarily in the long distance trucking. Um, so we haven't seen it yet necessarily in. Kind of more of our business where we're localized, you know, we're, we're going a, around the county, um, but we're we are expecting for our dump trucks, uh, for our vectors potentially that we will, at some point we will get there. Um, and primarily right now, thinking of electric, but that's certainly not to the exclusion of, of anything else. Um, you know, certainly the the passenger vehicles, the smaller vehicles, are something that we can do now. And and, and as I mentioned, um, you know, we have three in our current fleet. Uh, I mentioned the pickup that we are looking to, that would be our first pickup. Uh, we also have uh, one other passenger vehicle in the FY23 budget that we should be able to procure. Uh, we think that the heavy vehicles are still a little bit off, at least a couple of years, I think before we would be proposing um, to add, add a alternative fuel, probably electric to our fleet, but certainly something we're very interested in. And um, when, when the time right, it seems like when the, when the industry is there for, for public works, we will definitely be following that. Great, thank you. Let's see, Mark, you see any other hands up? No, I do not. Oh, there's Mike again. Okay, Mike. there's Mike, sorry. Will the, uh, the uh, fog electric generator at Durham be able to generate uh, enough electricity to power your electric vehicles plus all what it's doing now? I, I would leave that question to Nate to answer. He's available. Sure. Well, currently, the, uh, you're referring to the fog code gen facility we have at Durham. Right now, that produces about 60% of the electricity we use at the Durham treatment plant. Okay. We, we still are taking in power from the grid. Therefore, there's no direct surplus for the electric vehicles. But we are optimizing as much as possible our electrical production at the facilities. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. We'll move on to our next presentation on enterprise assets and technical services. Thank you. Um, good morning, chairs, boards, and everyone. Uh, can you have next slide, please? Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer Toh. I'm director 
for the Enterprise Access and Technical Service Department, uh, which we call EAT for short. Oh, can you go back to a previous slide, please? Thank you. Um, besides me, I have two additional staff will present with me today. Uh, Tanya Zinter, the project engineer, and she is in the access management team. And uh, also Pat Orr, senior mechanical engineer, he is in the facility development team. Next slide, please. Um, why the district is celebrating the 52nd year anniversary is it's maturing and is now one year old. We call it young. We are the same age as the regional utility service department that Joe Gore had mentioned earlier. This year, we have consolidated our facility program and safety program district-wide. Um, as you can see, our increase in material and service budgets come from chewing up the cost for all facility electricity, an allowance for lease office spaces, increase in service contract, and we consolidate safety equipment from other district program into one. The increase of the three FTE shown here, actually it was transferred to FTE from business resource group for the safety program. Uh, we do have one FTE new, what converted from a long-term temporary employee to full-time employee. Next slide, please. It have a um, five-man program beside administration for department management and program support. Um, we have access management program is to ensure that our assets stay in reliable service for their useful life or longer so we can get full values of our investment. Uh, the facility program provide building maintenance and services management as well as access renewal replacement for all district buildings, both we cover occupied and unoccupied buildings. For the technical support program, we provide mechanical, electrical implementation, engineering services to support capital improvement projects and operation and maintenance. The control system program provide automation to all treatment facility and support monitoring telemetry for all remote pump station and conveyance system. The safety program, this coming year, we are consolidating safety into a district-wide program so we can bring consistency standard practice to all cost work units, which will improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the safety for our employees. And for the next slide, uh, I would like to turn over the presentation to Tanya Singer. Tanya. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so today, Jennifer asked me here to share a little bit about our asset management program and some of the initiatives that we have implemented throughout this past fiscal year to um, help our program grow as we enter year two of our existence. And so, um, as Jennifer mentioned, our group, it, or CWS is 52 years old and we have many aging assets. And so the goal of our asset management program is to help us manage those capital replacements, as well as to ensure that we're focusing on preventative maintenance for our assets to extend the useful life of that equipment. Um, so last year, we also shared about our migration of our computerized maintenance management system within the water resource uh, broader resource recovery department to a new system known as Lucidity um, or EAM. And within that, we've had a lot of learning and growing over the last two years. And so we took this time to revisit what things are going well and what improvements we can make to actually strengthen our asset management within the water resource recovery department. Next slide, please. So one of the ways that we're trying to do this is to develop key performance indicators and dashboards that actually help us view that information that we enter into our system and be able to provide feedback to our superintendents and supervisors on the things that we're doing really well and on the things that maybe we can make some changes or adjustments uh, to improve our system. So this graph here is actually one of the KPIs we developed and it's looking at the estimated hours to perform the work, both preventive and corrective, versus the actual hours it took to complete that work. And as you can see, we, um, while we're estimating a lot of hours for the work that needs to be done, 
oftentimes it takes a little bit longer than we anticipated. And the reason why this is so important to look at and revisit is to make sure that we're able to uh, coordinate with our operations group to actually schedule that work within the requirements of the operating, operation of the treatment plan. We can reduce the risk of equipment downtime due to failure for items that weren't properly maintained, and also to help better utilize the resources that we have available at each of the treatment plants. Next slide, please. Um, another dashboard that we created is looking at our preventive maintenance that we have at the treatment plants and actually forecasting that over the course of one year. So we have many preventive maintenance plans within the district, and each of those have an allocated amount of hours that it takes to actually perform that work. And so when you start um, adding those up and you have weekly PMs and monthly PMs, and you compound them over the course of a year, you can get a graph like this. So we're looking at Rock Creek in this case, and each of the different um, groups within Rock Creek, so operations, electrical, instrumentation, and mechanical maintenance. Um, and you can see there's a lot of peaks and valleys. So now that we can actually see this information, we can go and actually coordinate with our supervisors to evaluate what work is being performed when and make some adjustments to actually balance that load throughout the course of the year. We can also take an opportunity to look at those times during permit changes to make sure that we're not causing struggles for the operations group who need that equipment online and available. So we just have a better way to actually look into the information that we have available in our maintenance management system and make it easier for our supervisors to process that. Uh, next slide, please. And the last thing that I want to share with you is about improvements we've made to our replacement Fund 106 uh, process. So something we focused on this year was actually identifying and documenting the process for what it takes to do an umbrella project within the Fund 106 uh, uh, budget we have allocated each year. Um, in years past, it was divided out across the different crafts, and each group had a different method in which they would go through a justification process and prioritization. So we've brought that all together within each treatment plant and now have a group that meets um, monthly that includes the superintendent, the supervisors, groups from asset management and treatment plant services to coordinate that effort and actually make sure that we're going through the same steps and prioritizing together as a group to identify what are the most important projects to meet the requirements of the treatment plant. Um, so this process just helps make sure that we're doing that in a standard consistent way as we move forward into the future. We also uh, developed a SharePoint list in order to document what we're working on today and what we're planning to work on in the future. So that way we have a good projections as we move forward for this uh, budget that we have available. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to Pat, who's gonna share about our facilities program. Thank you, Tanya. Good morning, everyone. I'm Patrick Orr and I work as a senior engineer in the EADS department. The district has been building, acquiring, and occupying many types of facilities since its inception. Currently, there are over 80 buildings the district occupies or uses to support its various missions. Historically, the upkeep and maintenance of the buildings and facilities has been the responsibility of various individuals in different departments throughout the district. The formation of a district-wide facilities group unites these efforts into one team focused on the care and maintenance of our facilities. One of the first steps in the formation of this group was to survey the district's facilities and gather missing information to be entered into the district's computerized maintenance man management system or LUCIDI. This provides the foundation for the team's efforts. Planned activities can be scheduled based on the required frequency and a history on the level of maintenance efforts are recorded. This will help provide cost metrics that can be used to help inform the district's capital planning. The team of people that will be responsible for the district's facilities is under construction. Currently, there are four dedicated positions and a plan to repurpose two more positions. The district's needs will continue to be monitored and as needs are identified, adjustments will be made. Next slide, please. There are numerous potential benefits of centralizing the facility's maintenance functions. A team of individuals with focused skill sets will be tailored to these requirements. 
Outside vendors will have a single point of contact in many cases, which should improve their response and level of effort. District staff will have a clear point of contact and readily available resources for their facility related concerns. The experience gained at one facility regarding the most effective approach to maintenance practices and procedures will be translated to all of the district's facilities. This will inevitably lead to the development of standards for facility related items throughout the district. The district necessarily uses a number of architects and engineers for the many facility related projects we are tasked with completing. At times, this results in a potpourri of different installations. Some of these we like and others become a challenge. Developing standards based on our knowledge district wide will be a considerable benefit and provides the district a seat at the table. Clear direction on the district's pre preference for functional elements of a building or facility will allow the design teams to focus on the more creative and impactful aspects of spaces and facilities. Next slide, please. The facilities team hit the ground running. One of the first areas we focused on was the condition of the roofs on our buildings. Two early projects were identified in the first stage of planning and completed in FY22. These projects provided an opportunity to inform the district staff that the facilities group was intent on making a difference. Planning for FY23 began in earnest. A comprehensive effort was made to help define the scope of the required effort. Using historical data and feedback from staff, the facilities team triaged the district's needs and completed roofing assessments of 14 buildings at five locations for over 48,000 square feet of roofing inspected and evaluated. This effort led to many repairs to extend the life of the existing roofs and membranes and also led to the capital plan for multiple roofing projects in FY23. The assessments helped the team to prioritize which roofs should be considered for replacement, what the replacement options were or are, and what the capital plan should look like to accomplish these goals. Thank you for your time. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Pat. Could you go next slide, please? So this is the end of our uh, each presentation for the uh, budget. Um, do you have any question? Look like Roy's. I see Commissioner Rogers has his hand raised. Yeah, I think it was back. Thank you. Was, I think it was back on page, uh, slide 77, 78. I, it's kind of a, a nerdy question, but I always get interested in that one. Yeah, there where you're talking about uh, looking at uh, the maintenance forecasting. Um, I, I understand how you're using it to, to say, well, gee, we have uh, certain times we need it and certain amounts of work, but is your analysis sophisticated enough to know is it operational uh, issues that maybe people don't have the proper training or maybe they're not as proficient at? Uh, are you using this as a management tool to evaluate your staff performance? Or are you using it simply as a, uh, I guess, some sort of a, a forecasting for your potential maintenance? How are you using this? Um, I would like to answer it, and then uh, Nate and Diane can add it into the the way we set up the maintenance for the equipment is pretty much based um, to. Two for one is based on the ONA manufacturer recommendation. And then second, based on our experience and the the seasonal of our how we operate our equipment that we factor that in. Since we have 15,000 pieces of equipment, we try to um, set up the, the the maintenance frequency based on that recommendation, but we make sure that we have enough staff to able to perform them. So when we put in the information like that, what our forecasting to look at 12 months uh, ahead, um, then we might um, actually have one month have too much of a maintenance hours and the other don't have it. So this tool is help us to help supervisor and our staff to make sure we balance it out all our equipment that we plan to maintain. That is the goal for this one. Yeah, I could add a little bit to that. So it's a good question. Nate, Nate, before, Nate before you do that, let me follow up because I, I know Jennifer, Jennifer is very capable on this stuff and she's forecasting what potential needs are. I was just curious, maybe you, you're going to answer that, that uh, 
it def forecast maintenance is always great, and I think it speaks well for your, your for your organization and what you're doing. But uh, you, you can't always know if you got the best and the most well-trained people doing that maintenance. So how, how do you know? Because I was hearing that at times you forecast a certain amount of work and it takes a lot longer. Is that due to uh, to equipment wear, or is it due to operational issues in, in your staff? So, so that's what, really my question. Sure. Let me see if I can help address that because there's there's two uses of this tool. One is to actually do the maintenance and level out the maintenance to uh, optimize the use of the staff. And the other is, and I think where you're going is, it can be used for the the treatment staff. Logan Olds is the superintendent, uh, the super services manager for treatment, he can work with his superintendents to track how much work is being done when, and is there's ways to improve that? Is it some performance issue with the staff? Are they paying attention to it? So it has two purposes. It can be used for the maintenance of itself, making sure we're doing it on time. And it also can be used to monitor and have metrics for the staff's performance. So yeah, it's actually gonna be used for both of those. Thank you. And I just want to add what Nate said too. Part of the our staff performance um, is based on the the time that they put in the work order that we're tracking through the uh, CMS system. So I, I also wanted. I thought it was a really good question, Roy, because embedded in your question is a workforce question, right? Do we have the right number of people? Are they trained properly, and are they executing? the program efficiently and effectively. Right now, we, we at Clean Water Services, um, we have some really highly trained um, journeymen and, and folks that can address the complexity of the plants, right? But because of the age of the equipment and because our tolerance for downtime of this equipment is getting tighter and tighter, we not only have to have talented people, right? We also have to streamline their work so that we are properly maintaining the equipment, we're properly addressing the condition and we're able to take actions in a streamlined manner. But also embedded in your workforce question, and this is something Nate and the team we worry about is because of the transition of the generations and because of the new people coming um, to our industry, there's a huge gap developing in terms of training. So the one program we did not showcase in this budget that um, would be great to showcase with the board um, and um, CWAC is the apprenticeship program that Nate and Logan and the entire team is developing because we need one new people to come into our industry that are trained through this apprenticeship program to become the operators and the mechanics and the electricians of the future. But we also have a technical gap where people don't have access to the training that they need to become instrumentation and control and the higher end electrical work. So from a workforce standpoint, Clean Water Services is very active in trying to really develop that pipeline because if not, we're not careful, these the talented people are leaving our organization. So we're being very um, explicit and mindful of that. And what we wanted to do was to have a more formalized program. So when you have talented, well um, experienced people, they can make the decisions um, based on that experience. Now we're creating a formalized program to make sure we're efficient and effective and we have um, guidance for our new leaders of the future. But I really appreciate that question. And um, it is quantity of work, it is quality of work but it's also cost efficiency and effectiveness. Because if we're not careful, because of the age of this equipment, we will have increased downtime and increased costs um, to do the repair. Plus with the supply chain problems, we have to forecast earlier of when we're bringing this equipment in so we can actually do the repair and replacement. So thank you. I hope that kind of helps contextualize the no, Diane, I just follow up really quickly and say thank you. You anticipated where I was going, and that, that's good. It, it, uh, we're in a very interesting period of time in all industry. You can forecast all you want, the number of hours, but unless people have the training and the capability of doing these jobs, uh, you, you get some false uh, indicators. You kind of say, well, things uh, maybe my equipment's bad. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's your operators have not the 
ability to do it in the time. Or maybe you say, my my operators can't do it right, uh, and maybe it's the equipment, and so you're using it both measured both sides. It would be interesting at some point to hear what you're doing because it, uh, it, it's, it's a serious area of concern. I mean, the baby boomers are leaving in droves, uh, and they're not uh, leaving the, any industry, including yours, in the best of conditions because not, not by design, it's just that their age, they're leaving, and we're not finding folks to backfill, especially in those critical areas where there's a lot of skills necessary, and you're one of them. It, uh, you, you just don't go out and find a, you know, a, a Jennifer or a Nate every day of the week. I mean, there, you can find people who can certainly have those categories and say that they have those skills, but they may not have that background of experience. And so, you know, it, it just be curious. I, I'm, I'm spending way too much time, but it, to me, this is the nub of a success in an organization is the continuity of skill sets, having the proper people in the proper places, evaluating to see if they're doing the proper amount of work. Uh, and, and without that, uh, any organization, especially one like yours, or any county government, city government, if they're not doing that, they're going to have some real problems in the near future. So thanks, Diane, for considering that. Thank you, Commission Roger. Do you have any other question for us? Uh, Mark, I don't see any more hands up. No, I don't either, uh, Chair Song. So what I would uh, like to do is indulge you all for our last presentation before we let you take a lunch. Um, this is probably going to push us out to 12.10 before we're done. But I want to make sure we cover the major operating units before we do lunch, and then we'll just push lunch back a little bit if that's okay. So with that, I will go ahead. Thank you. Hand it over to the Natural Systems Group. So Bruce, that would be you, you're on. Can we go back to the first slide, please? Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Budget Committee, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm gonna take a couple of moments to reflect because we, we've had some really huge accomplishments over the last 10, 15 years. And I want to reflect on the things that make my heart full as I present this budget to you. You know, my heart is full seeing the 800 plus projects completed and 150 river miles of restoration done. You know, my heart's full because of the support we've gotten from CWS board members and the community. You know, the community is 40 plus partners at Tree for All who are investing millions and millions of dollars along with CWS in our natural assets. So I, I want to make sure I'm always putting a shout out for these partners because they are bringing millions of dollars to this very special program called Tree for All that is occurring in the basin. Little diversion, but I, I think another reason my heart's full, I was had the benefit of attending the uh, uh, Toast of Tourism last night. And you'd say, well, well Bruce, why did you attend that? Well. It was another opportunity for my heart to feel full because as I watched the slideshow of premier uh, tourist destinations, I kept seeing the projects we've completed as Tree for All Partners. That makes my heart very full when I think of, you know, the assets we're creating are not only helping us meet our regulatory requirements, but they're also creating premier tourism destinations. So sorry for that divergence. Next slide, please. Today you're going to hear from me. I'm going to give a quick budget overview, uh, talk about the FTEs, and then you're going to hear, and I want to spend most of the time so you can hear from the people that, in my mind, do all the hard work in the departments, you know, Rich Hunter, Jill Erickson, and, and Matt Brennan. These are three division managers. Uh, I will remind the Budget Committee and Board that, you know, we've been going through a reorganization these past year or two, and we've finally stood up all three divisions. Uh, our newest division uh, that we just stood up was uh, Jill's division, Stewardship, which you'll hear more about. Next slide, please. Uh, you look at this budget, you'll say, uh-oh, what's going on here? Well, I, I remind you what I just said a couple seconds ago. 
we've just stood up a new division uh, in our department and stewardship is that division. As I mentioned, we've done 800 plus projects. Uh, I get great joy again talking about these 800 projects because they are my, uh, you know, assets that are increasing in value over time. And I want to ensure through our stewardship divisions that we are able to care and keep these great assets in that a mode of continuing to appreciate. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the three divisions, uh, I would expect, uh, you know, you see uh, five sitting in uh, administration, but uh, landscape strategies is fully staffed at the mall, or is almost fully staffed. We have some uh, positions to hire. Uh, project delivery headed by uh, Matt Brennan, uh, that's our engineers and our people delivering projects on the ground, is, is going great guns. You'll see many of those projects throughout the basin that are happening, whether it's the refuges or uh, Denny to Hall, we saw pictures earlier in some of those projects. And then our, our last division here, our other division, stewardship, which you'll hear more about in a minute, uh, is the newest one. And we found, you know, we were very good at finding the great transformational partnerships. We were very good at finding multi-funded uh, projects that uh, create fantastic results. We also found that we can do a million plants in the ground every year but we also are getting to a point in the program where we want to make sure that all these assets are going to be healthy for future generations. And that is a big driver of our stewardship program. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Rich Hunter, who will then take, take it from here. Rich. Thanks, Bruce. Good afternoon, budget committee and board members. It's an honor to be here and thanks for the opportunity. A um, little bit more about these 800 projects and what they're all about. As you know, since 2004, Clean Water Services has met its permit requirements for elevated effluent temperature through a variety of strategies, including you know, reducing the load, actually reducing temperatures, stored water releases from Scoggins and Barney, um, and also restoring forests near waterways, which helps reduce stream temperature through shading of the water. And this year, Clean Water Services completed a significant phase of strategic planning for this thermal compliance over a time frame of five to 50 years. And so this time frame and scope really allowed us to think about the children of the Tualatin Basin and their, their economic and their environmental future here. Um, so, so through coordinated, integrated work, we evaluated dozens of approaches and variety of scenarios to determine the optimal suite of strategies for Clean Water Services to uh, meet its temperature requirements through cost-effective delivery of multiple benefits over the long term. Um, and this analysis resulted in the decision to focus on meeting the needs of the environment and the river through a variety of strategies, including working with reclamation and water resource partners to secure our existing water supply at Scoggins Dam through the Safety of Dams program, um, expanding water reuse, uh, including wetland enhancement, which you heard about from Rick earlier, um, and then expanding riparian reforestation and our water rights work. Um, so in terms of shade credit over the last 15 years, we've amassed a large portfolio of more than 1 billion kilocalories worth of cooling to the river and its tributary streams, which is a lot to take care of. Um, and since that offset um, to our thermal load lasts as long as the native vegetation remains, we are investing in stewardship to maintain that existing credit portfolio. And you'll hear more about that from Jill in a few minutes. Um, to meet the requirements for growth of thermal loads, we're also pursuing an initiative to continue growing this riparian reforestation program and adding um, new stream miles and new sites to the program. Um, as well as we're increasing our ability to support planning and delivery of improvements for other regulatory needs of development like stormwater and our utility infrastructure. Next slide. So how do we do this? We do this through our tree for all approach. And this means that we convene and bring the community resources together to scale up the actions that Clean Water Services can take on its own to achieve a really monumental result as a collective. Um, and to be successful with securing the land access, the funding, the community support to enable more shade credit to meet our requirements, 
We explore and promote these broader community values to align ourselves with over 40 different partners from government, nonprofit sectors, and, and private residents. This connects us and helps us identify the intersections of this work to future work with groups like urban planning, transportation, and health community. Next slide. So as Bruce mentioned, through all this coordination and alignment with partners, we've been able to scale up and create some impressive outcomes on a really countywide scale. You can see there the, the map of the Tualatin Basin and the, the district boundary in orange and the reach of our, our program going across the, across the entire um, basin. And each one of these sites has a story. Um, and we have a fantastic website called jointreeforall.org that captures us in a variety of formats. Um, at this point in the program, we're pleased to be exploring the next phase of strategic planning with partners to see where we can go next uh, with enhancing and stewarding natural systems in the Tualatin Basin as a community through coordination and collaboration together. And so to tell you more about this and the stewardship work, I'd like to introduce uh, Jill Erickson. Next slide. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. As you've heard, the stewardship program was created during the reorganization to meet a growing need to manage assets. Our transformational partnerships and these enhancement projects that have transitioned from site prep to establishment and into stewardship. So thank you for your support. I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to join this team. What an incredible time to be working in natural resources. So just a little bit more insight about this new program, this new division, and to highlight how the increase in funding is going to help us to continue to deliver on clean water services priorities. So what is stewardship all about? We're managing all of the plant material for these enhancement projects. So from start to finish, which you're seeing here in the photos, um, and you're hearing about what Rich was talking about, these outcomes, these projects. We're monitoring those projects and we're taking care of them. So we're supporting and coordinating with all of those partners that are critical to taking care of these projects and being ready for the next projects that are coming. So for instance, this past year, we moved nearly 850,000 bare root plants, as you can see here. We rented a cooler, coordinated with nurseries, project managers, and partners, and then we moved those to get them out onto the ground, as you see in that second photo, where these plants are doing the good work for the river. Stewardship has to be considered and embedded at all levels for success. You can't just think about it at the end, and that takes those FTEs that we're talking about in the budget. It's like, you know, you, you shouldn't just go see your doctor when something's hurting. You should be going for regular checkups. You should be following the guidelines for good health. There's an old adage that says that the best fertilizer is a gardener's shadow. So in other words, how does this play out in stewardship? What does it look like? Next slide. This is just one story about all of these projects that you've been hearing us talk about. So it's one that isn't getting national attention like Chicken Creek, or making local headlines like Balm Grove, which you'll hear about from Matt shortly, or even winning awards like Fano Creek. Well, not yet. What you're looking at is a really good example of what stewardship is all about. This is 22 acres in Cornelius along McKay Creek. We just planted more than 20,000 bare root trees, shrubs, and wildflowers with the help of two classes from the Swallowtail Elementary School and a local business, Mosaic Ecology. This is just the most recent work since we started there in 2018. The school owns and manages the land, which they use for educational programming for the area elementary schools. The project area is just, just short of a mile along the Cake Creek that is providing shade credit and meeting our regulatory requirements. It's been in partnership with the Soil and Water Conservation District and a local farmer that we've been able to remove the non-native invasive plants and we were challenged to use only organic site preparation and this was a first for us on this scale. 
But being challenged to create solutions is what we do for all of our projects. And then we look at these creative solutions and how we can apply them across the basin. This is how we are able to take care of this vast network of natural systems. And these are assets that are increasing in value every day. So we're looking for opportunities to teach children, restore unused farmland, support local businesses, and innovate new methods. And yes, each project provides shade, but so much more. Next slide, and I'll turn things over to Matt. Thanks, Jill. Good afternoon. This summer, Clean Water Services, in collaboration with a number of partners, will begin removing Balm Grove Dam, an artificial obstruction in Gales Creek. Balm Grove Dam once served to create a swimming hole for the community and was a community gathering point, but was, but was since abandoned. This project will have a great benefit to watershed health it's one of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's highest priority fish passage barriers in the entire Tualatin River Basin. When the dam is removed and the site is restored, Gales Creek will flow more freely and over 25 miles of high quality stream habitat will be available to fish who currently struggle to move upstream. Removal of Balm Grove Dam will take a couple of years to complete and will address a local need while benefiting the whole watershed. Next slide, please. This big win for watershed health is possible because of the many partners that are involved. We've received support from the Tualatin River Watershed Council, the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District, Metro, and also have been awarded grants from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. This team of project partners allows us to catalyze a great improvement to the watershed health without the district shouldering all of the costs of that work. And with the next slide, I'll pass it along to Bruce. Thank you. Makes me very proud. I've got a great team of people to work with. So thank you, team. I enjoy hearing it over and over. I can't hear enough of it, so thank you. You know, the future, you know, is very bright for us. Uh, I, I'm so pleased that we're now working at a scale with all of these partners that will really be the kind of scale we need to do for climate change, uh, to create the kind of resilient watershed. You know, that you look at that picture in the middle and you go, well, what's that? A flooded farm field. That's a good thing. That means we've got conductivity, connectivity to the floodplain and it's a place for the river to breathe. So seeing that, you know, makes me smile. Thinking of all the projects where we're helping maintain that access to the floodplain is great. Uh, and it's also, you know, what we've created for both the wildlife, keystone critters like the beaver, but also the human participants and the new human participants that we're bringing into the Tree for All program. You know, I, I was blessed with getting to do a fun project for distribution of PPE during COVID. And, and you know, a, a logical way to distribute was to work with Tree for All partners and find the, the groups and others that needed uh, those assets. And, you know, that group was able to do over 2 million uh, masks out the door. But what I learned is that I've got a whole bunch of new partners in the farm workers groups that we worked with the uh, food banks we worked with, the uh, daycares and others that we worked with in this distribution process. And these are many groups that now understand these assets are getting connected to programs like Paseos Verde where they can go out and explore and learn about their watersheds. So I'm, I'm excited about finding a bunch of new partners and new partners that we begin to find with the COVID situation, but also expanding our existing partners. Uh, Paseos Verde, which we didn't talk about today, is one that's gone from a, an idea into a full program, and THPRD is piled on, and Virginia Garcia, and all these others. It's just a wonderful opportunity. I hope we see more programs like that. So with that, uh, next slide, and I'll open it up for questions. Lori. Uh, thank you. Uh, this question is from Mr. Hunter. 
Uh, you mentioned the um, you mentioned creating a complex model to optimize strategies, and I think I heard that uh, some community values went into that. Um, could you speak a little uh, about that, please? Yeah, thanks, Lori. Um, we we have some very very talented people uh, on staff internally, and we worked uh, with a with a really great group of folks um, to craft that. And so, uh, hats off to Scott Mansell in the research and innovation group for developing um, the most wicked spreadsheet model I've ever seen, um, which incorporated, as I said, dozens of different scenarios and and alternatives for meeting temperature compliance. And yes, we did uh, a very intentional process around um, including a broad set of values and objectives for measuring the, the alternatives. Um, and I'd just say broadly, it was across sort of financial, uh, environmental, and social factors. Um, and that was a, a involved process over, over many months um, with quite a bit of documentation available. So I'd be happy to uh, connect you with that uh, offline after the meeting. Could you just give us a clue to a few things that went in regarding the social, socioeconomic stuff? Thanks. Sure. Well, um, the uh, social factors included things like um, benefits to um, community groups, um, connection of uh, neighborhoods to um, natural resources um, and uh, the opportunity to work with a variety of different sectors of the economy. So as Bruce mentioned, working with um, the farm community, working with the urban community um, and, and a variety of different um, uh, factors in that. Thank you. Chair Harrington. Thank you. I appreciate uh, how this budget document is put together. Uh, it has a really nice mix of, you know, the, the financial brass tax data uh, intermixed with pictures as well as the sidebar information. And for this area of the clean water services business, I think pages 171 through 174 do a nice job of speaking to the program at the very high level and the cumulative investment over the course of time. And the message of partnerships and sticking, you know, the, the, how over the years, the number of partnerships has grown and uh, the promise of the continued work together, especially in the face of uncertainty with more climate changes is very clear. Uh, I wanna thank you, uh, Rich, Jill and Matt for speaking to the different aspects today. Uh, and I particularly appreciated Rich, you're being clear about caring for the land and the data that you shared verbally, and then adding new stream miles and the numbers you gave on that. Um, and then Jill, you talked about management of assets and how through prior, prior work, moving from site prep to enhancement to now stewardship. What I would ask is for next budget year that um, the more data is included in the document about what you have done this past year and what you're hoping to do this fiscal year. That's missing here. Uh, and we, it's, it's great to hear the cumulative effect over the many years. Um, and we have three pages of sidebars that tell that story. But what's missing is what are we getting this budget year by investing $7.8 million, right? We got one set of public comment uh, 
information this morning asking very pointed questions. And it's very easy for me to look at the budget and say, well, this is why, right? Um, and I'm not at all uh, moving away from knowing how incredibly powerful these investments are. But I would really like to ensure that the kind of numbers that I had the pleasure of hearing you articulate today are actually in the document for our community members to have full access to. So keep up the great work. I'm loving it. I, I want to I want to see them see it a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So noted. Next up, Mike. I have a question. I have a question about uh, the future. Say this summer we have uh, large forest fires in the Tualatin Basin and the Barney Reservoir Basin. Would this program be able to one financially participate in the cost of controlling the fires? Then would you be able to financially and otherwise participate in the reforestation efforts to get as much of that shade back as soon as we can? I think there's two parts and I can answer some of it. I'm going to also turn it over to Jack who's working on the forest management. Jack Lane's group is working on the forest management strategy for the basin. He can kind of talk about what's going on there and to fight the forest fires. I think specific to the reforestation, clearly we would be able to invest in the repairing corridors that have been exposed and had issues uh, during uh, fires. That is a concern of ours, but also at the same time, having them in their natural state, having beavers presence creates a little more resilience than you'd have otherwise in that case. But in terms of uh, the tree for all program, uh, investing mo money, it will be at the will of those partners that are there that want to invest there, you know, and we can invest in those elements that are tied to our regulatory uh, requirements. So I don't know that Jack's on, he can talk about the work that his team's doing on forestry and uh, wildfire management. Yes, thank you, Bruce. Yeah. So my one part of my team is working on a portfolio of uh, strategy projects that is uh, related with integrated water resource management. And within the body of this uh, project, we're not quite there yet, we're actually just starting this work, is uh, related with the climate, con uh, climate action, uh, related considerations, and how do we actually build a resilient watershed that is more resilient to the drastic, um, to the drastic changes in the climate um, environment that we're subject to. And in addition to that effort, we're also looking creatively in our risk management and the insurance um, area to see if we can find ways to value this uh, repair and shade credit that we have created and how do we actually from a, a uh, insurance perspective ensure that we actually uh, build a program that can help us financially in an event like that where we have a loss uh, with the repair and shade. Now, both of those are in its initial stage of development. So I can't speak with confidence that we have a, a strategy that's in place already. So if you're asking about this next year's mitigation strategy, we are still in a, a little more responsive a responsive uh, pattern. Um, but going forward, once we have these two projects, um, they are more, uh, they're more, uh, more developed and, and they are more matured, we can definitely have a much better and confident strategy against that. Thank you. I wanted to add, I really appreciate that question, Mike, because as we move forward into the future with these drier droughts, we're going to see the wildfire um, issue increasing. So about three years ago, we catalyzed um, a conversation with all of the partners um, in the watershed about taking a look at our fire risk um, in, in the upper watershed and what we would do as pre-planning to one, understand it, two, come up with mitigation plans, and three, how would we recover? So we're um, along in that process. We know where the um, risk areas are from um, land, the, the, the geology in terms of landslide risk. So there's a lot of detail that has been determined, but you hit the nail on the head. It's when that emergency happens, how are we going to recover? 
So for clean water services, we know that 10 per, about 10% of our inventory of um, the shade credit uh, projects has a potential risk. So we're now working through what that risk means as it relates to the utility. We're also continuing to work with our broader partners because clean water services can help add to the risk emergency response. Certainly we want to have the obligation as Jack talked about to have the insurance of our own to be able to restore it, but we're a small piece. Um, we rely on state and federal resources um, to fight wildfires, but certainly it's a drinking water, ag, forestry, it's a huge issue. So it is going to take um, this constant coordination effort to be able to um, start parsing it out. But um, you're, you hit the nail on the head. How do you recover if and when it does occur? Um, but we do see the risk we, and we're better understanding of what that risk is. It seems there's, you know, recovering in the actual drainage area that is burned. But once you have a lot of bare area there, you're going to have erosion issues that are going to show up all the way from Hales Creek to Tualatin. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's one of the things that's on the list of what are we doing about that? Or what will we do? Or what will we be able to do? Mm -hmm. We brought in um, experts um, that are trying to find the solutions um, down in the California area. You know, they, they were hit really hard. And all of those observations you have are exactly what happened. It's not just the fire and the firefighting, but it's what happens to the watershed um, with all of the soil that is now exposed, as well as the soil behaves very differently after a fire right. and, and how the runoff occurs. But you're absolutely right. This is an area I think that the region is trying to figure out how are we going to respond? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So from a process standpoint, uh, Chair, Chair Song, uh, we thank you all for your indulgence as we've gone through and told these stories and had the opportunity to answer questions that you have. We are late, obviously uh, about an hour late on our lunch. And what I'd like to recommend to you and ask for your input is whether or not we could take a break and come back at 1.15. I think that would allow us to be completed with assuming that we meet our schedule after lunch could be completed by two or 2.15. So um, I'm Curious about the, the the interest of the group in terms of going to uh, coming back at one fifteen. Does that work for people? I'm good with that. Um, does anybody else uh, not want that? Works for me. Works for me as well. Mark. 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 Uh, yes. I've got I've I've got issues in the afternoon, and I'm wondering if we could come back at one. Half hour lunch. There's, there's a new idea. That would certainly work for staff. It's up to the committee. Would you be willing to come back in 35 minutes, I guess? We're I'm okay to come back. Okay, let's do that. We will reconvene at one o'clock. It's currently 1224. So we will see you in 36 minutes. Okay, uh, Mark, one thing. Yes. Uh, uh, Fatima, did you have your hand up earlier with a question? I did, but my question was addressed, so thanks, Song. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will see everyone at one o'clock then. Thank you.
Mark, I can probably ask you this question. I'm going to remain off camera for just a bit and eat some lunch. That was too quick a period of time for me, but I'll, I'll be listening. I'm I'm back to Mark. I'm just off camera. So I'd like to welcome you back to this afternoon. Um, it's one o'clock. I appreciate the shortened um, lunch period there. So I will wait till folks can step back into the room here with us. So we can proceed. So do we have to, so Mark, do we, do we have to tell you when we eat our payday? Because, because I really cheated and ate it yesterday, but it was really good. <laughs> You're not supposed to eat it till after you've taken a motion on the budget. You're not supposed to eat it until it's really a day. <laughs> we'll, con we'll consider the advance of the commissioner cheese. My well, the sorry, my husband stole mine before I could get at it. <laughs> we'll have to pay you back, Mark. Exactly. Or I can get you another one. Um, so I want to make sure that I have yep, I've got Terry on here. I, I want to start with the first thing. It looks like Matt, you have your uh, hand up. I do. I um I'm concerned that uh, the sections that I should have asked the questions passed me by, and and so is there a um, is there a process? I guess later on before we make a motion, is there a kind of a, a holistic Q and A at that point in time? Or that'd be excellent. Yeah, after okay. we're done with the next section, okay, broad questions across the whole budget would be well. Okay. Okay, so Chair Song, if you're ready to move forward, I will go ahead and ask Kathy Leader to step in and, and start us on our, our last broad department there. I am, Mark. Thank you. And we can start with business services. Thank you, Chair Song. So I'm Kathy Leader, Chief Financial Officer with Clean Water Services. I'm going to be opening up the um, business services portion of the uh, budget. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the budget overview for business services, and then later on in the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about our new uh, implementation of our utility billing system. Mark Jockers, our chief of staff, will also be talking about some new programs that, that we're standing up this next year. And then Jack Lang, will, uh, our chief strategy officer, will be talk also be talking about some new, new programs we're standing up, the transition of treasury services and cybersecurity. Next slide. Business services includes the administrative programs that support clean water services operations and services provided to customers. The proposed budget for fiscal year 23 includes 27.6 million in operating expenditure expenditures that is an increase of 4.7 million or 21% compared to the prior year. The increase reflects the consolidation and addition of new programs in the department. Personal service costs increased by 2 million or 14%, reflecting the net addition of 11 FTE positions. Three new positions were added, 10 employees were transferred from other programs, and two staff were transferred out of risk for the safety program into enterprise assets and technical services that Jennifer Toe mentioned earlier on. Material and services increased by 2.7 million or 31%. This mainly relates to an increase in professional service costs of 908,000 to support new programs for culture, equity, and learning, and strategy development enterprise performance management, and the transition of treasury services from the county to clean water services. Software costs increased by 119,000, including 331,000 to support the new utility billing system that I'll talk about later. 
and uh, another $400,000 increase relates to insurance costs due to rate increases in property, tax, property values. Next slide, please. The business services group includes 12 separate programs that support district operations and services provided to customers. This year, this year's budget includes two new programs, including culture equity and learning and strategy development and enterprise performance management and the consolidation of support staff from throughout the district into the administrative services program. Next slide, please. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Mark Jockers as our chief of staff. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm gonna talk about, the, Kathy just mentioned two, three new programs in the business services uh, department. And two of those programs are pieces that sit within the portfolio of the chief staff's office, which, is, which I operate. The one that we're really excited about is uh, the creation of this, of our new culture equity and learning uh, program. We certainly recognize that creating a welcoming and supportive culture connects really strongly to our need for, for innovation and our need to recruit future talent for this organization. The new program we've been incubating over the last two years within my group, particularly within our community engagement and employee communication or employee engagement program, to incubate a program on, on particularly on equity learning with our leadership and with our employees. And as we worked on that, we really recognized that, that, that equity it, it does not move forward without uh, a culture that supports that and learning that supports that because it is, it is a journey. It's a lifelong learning issue. And we wanna look at how we build both the culture and the learning and the equity there. This program includes two FTEs. These are pro, uh, FTEs that have been transferred over from our communication and community engagement group. And we're really trying to create a place Enterprise-wide, district-wide, how do we create that culture where employees can learn, grow, and thrive? And this is how, how do we put those district-wide, organization-wide, organizational development and learning programs in place? Uh, this, this program is going to be very closely integrated with our HR department, which is often where organizational development or learning resides, but we've decided to put it in this other bucket at this point. And it's also going to work very closely with our communications and employee engagement programs. And if we go to the next slide, I can talk about the other program that has been created. The next program that's new, and it's, it's not really that new, it's just really a consolidation, is an administrative services program. Uh, that, that's, an, again, an enterprise-wide function. It brings together 11 staff from seven different departments. When Kathy talked about the staff movement, uh, uh, this is where a lot of it comes from. A lot of them are coming from other departments. Of those 11 staff, one, one of them is a new FTE. It's, a, it's the uh, transfer of a long time temporary to a permanent position, to a regular position rather. This administrative services group will be centrally managed with staff embedded within departments. Our effort there is to how do we optimize and kind of share work among the administrative staff? How do we align business practices and policies district-wide? You know, we have many different locations, as you heard about. How do we make sure we have practices and policies in place? And also, I think it's important for us to make sure we're aligning kind of career training and career pathing associated with, with, those, uh, with those particular staff. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Jack who talk about the third uh, new or retitled program that's in the business services department. So you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Mark. And uh, next I want to introduce this uh, kind of new um, program that is within our budget structure. It's called strategy development and enterprise performance management. The reason I say that it's kind of new is because that we actually consolidated two existing programs that was in last year's budget together. Uh, that is the business strategy program as well as a financial strategy program. And in addition to that, we also added in additional resources to address um, strategy development across the organization in various areas. As you can see on the slide, this program is really, the purpose of this program is really to bring our strategy approach to life as well as continue on with the organization's strategy development 
and, and helping with the implementation in the departments and supporting the department's implementation. As uh, Commissioner Rogers uh, mentioned earlier, it's uh, very critical for the organization to really have the right people in place and really look at our organizational strategy, ensuring that we have the right folks pursuing the right goals uh, on the right projects to ensure our future success. And that is the, the core mission of this program. And within the program, we have some direct initiatives that are led directly by members of this program that includes the strategic planning, that also includes the financial planning aspect, as well as the integrated planning and project management and the regulatory and compliance strategies. In addition to that, we also collaborate with partners in the departments to look at our people st strategy with the previously mentioned cultural equity and learning group, as well as human resources. We partner up with digital solutions and research and innovation to look at our technology and innovation strategies, as well as we partner up with the risk management team to mitigate our risks for the organization and then look at our risk management strategy. And we also work actively with our communication team to, um, to design our communication strategies. And uh, there's a lot of direct initiatives and collaborative initiatives that are happening all at the same time. And this is a new program that we have incubated and then it, it's going into uh, its full blossom state in this next year. Next slide, please. Next, another thing that we are doing that's fairly new to the district is a transition of the treasury services function. And the district's treasury was previously managed by the county uh, as a fiduciary for the district. And then we're transitioning that to our self-managed. So essentially the treasury service will be managed as CWS directly. And the purpose of this transition is to align our investment policies and activities that will match CWS specific cash flow and the project delivery trends uh, in the future. The CWS line of business is slightly different from the county as well as our revenue flow is slightly different from the county. We see this transition will actually provide CWS a much more catered and uh, focused investment policy and investment strategy going forward that will serve the district well. And as a result of that, me as a chief strategy officer has been delegated by the chief executive officer to serve the treasurer function for the district with support from staff in the finance team. Next slide, please. And now I want to pivot to our technology area where cybersecurity is definitely one area that we're making a little more investment um, toward. As you are all aware that we are in a very tough cybersecurity climate and that the environment in the cybersecurity world is continue to present challenges to any organization, any organization that are connected to networks. And CWS is definitely one of those. We see those challenges very seriously and we want to take very mindful and strategic steps to strengthen our position in this area. And this year's investment, we actually have one FTE that was actually a media ad. So when you look at the technical budget document, you may not necessarily see one FTE difference there, but this media ad was in added fairly late in the last fiscal year. So the full effect of the cost and the budget will actually um, be effective in this new fiscal year. And that is one cybersecurity analyst that will help us enhance our internal expertise as well as support internal awareness, training, um, looking at our system, our infrastructure to ensure that we're resilient to a reasonable level as an organization. In addition to that, we also added professional services dollars to conduct penetration tests and address vulnerabilities in, from a system perspective. So both from a dedicated employee perspective and contracted help perspective, we are really taking our cybersecurity stance at the district very seriously. Next slide, please. I'll pass it on to Kathy to go over the customer information system. Thank you, Jack. Clean Water Services joint bills with Tualatin Valley Water District for customers we serve in unincorporated Washington County, along with clean water only city accounts. Clean Water Services and Tualatin Valley Water District partnered together back in 2018 in a project to replace the legacy billing system with a modern customer information system. This has been a multi-year project, starting with a meter to cash audit, software selection, and finally implementation of the new billing system. Next slide, please. The new billing system will provide enhanced customer satisfaction through a modern customer facing portal, allowing the customers to manage their accounts online. 
There'll be greater integration with key business systems. We'll be able to manage utility risk through better controls, state management and vendor support and provide enhanced data analytics. The partners selected Open SmartFlex as a, as a cloud solution for our um, billing system. The estimated cost to complete the project is $12 million, which will be allocated between the partners. The go live date is set for July 5th, 2022. So it's coming up fairly quickly here. Next slide, please. So that concludes the business services um, portion of the presentation. Um, we're open for any questions you might have. Looks like I saw Matt first, right? Thank you. Um, is the permit center falling under that new administrative services group? No, uh, Matt, that, that isn't. The permit center sits within regional utility services department Okay. Uh, under Joe Gall's leadership. So that's where Damon, who you work with a lot, and Andy are uh, sitting. Yeah, I just making sure that there wasn't kind of a, a split going on there. So thank you. Uh, Chair Harrington. You're muted. Don't yes, leave. I am. Sorry. <laughs> um, so this slide uh, uh, reminded me that I was wondering the DIY sensors that I think you've deployed at least over the last two, three years. Um, this isn't so much a budget question, I guess, but how's how's the life cycle of those working out? Are you are you getting as much life out of them as you hoped, or did they surprise you either way? That that is such a nice question, uh, Chair Harrington. And uh, to answer that question, I I can only answer it in a way that we haven't seen any problems with the life cycle with those devices. The team is uh, uh, definitely continuing to deploy more sensors and uh, in a more creative way. Uh, both from a, a vendor perspective and also we're kind of adding in our own research and innovation um, technologies to it to make it a little more resilient and um, I believe in a previous tour that you toured our repo center and uh, have interacted with the research and innovation you have seen some of our 3d printers that we actually pr pr uh, print out covers for those sensors that protect them from the environment a little yeah. bit better so I can only answer that we have not seen any um, any problems related with the life cycle on those sensors at this moment. So, so in 2019, uh, the board went on a, a tour, uh, thanks to Clean Water Services staff and uh, looked at various sites. And that included showing us a couple of sites where you had some of the sensors employed or deployed. It might be interesting to just see some data sometime uh, because it's a very innovative thing, uh, entrepreneurial thing uh, or, or feature uh, of clean water services. And so just knowing, you know, how did like an initial pilot go, uh, first year launch, second year launch, and I have no idea what the anticipated life cycle was for one of these things. I mean, for all I know, it could have been one rainy season and that was good. So anyway, I just thought it might be an interesting highlight sometime. So thank you very much. Keep up the good work. We'll thank add you, that, yeah, we'll add that to one of our um, board learning sessions and if CWAC's interested, because it, it is collecting more data on the watershed that we didn't have insight on before. So that would be really great. Um, sorry, I did, I finally turned the page and so I had a couple of other FYI questions. Um, I really want, first I, I wanna start with a thank you, Diane. I appreciate how out of the office of the CEO, you've helped ensure that uh, equity and diversity is 
part of the, the culture of clean water services. Uh, and uh, through the, the multi-year organizational development uh, that you've put in place uh, through uh, your vision and the staff, it's, it's really wonderful to see how uh, it's delivering through employee satisfaction, employee engagement, as well as uh, workforce development over the course of time. Uh, <clears throat> under business opportunities and operations on page 114, you touch on procurement. And um, I was wondering how things might be going in terms of setting things up so that um, there is support for uh, apprentice use in all of the, the capital improvement contracts. You know, uh, I'm more than happy to help sponsor a policy for the board's consideration, for example, to ensure that uh, our contractors are supporting uh, apprentice programs in order to allow for that pipeline up to the journeyman level, um, but also uh, the utilization of COVID uh, firms as well so that we continue to grow a uh, foster the development of more local um, uh, uh, minority women and emerging small businesses uh, uh, through, through the um, use of uh, service uh, customer uh, rate payer dollars. So any comments on that? Mark can probably weigh in too with the procurement team. So we're really assessing our as is, right? What are our metrics today? And then what levers do we need to put in place to really drive it in that direction? And the first area that they're really looking at is analyzing the contracts that we have and which ones would be uh, really great to push out on the COVID pipeline. We did work on our CMGC pro um, project with um, on Cedar Mill North Johnson, specifically with that contractor to see what they could do to um, implement um, the diversity, equity, inclusion principles that we had. So I, we could get a more detailed report. I think that would be really helpful. I know Mark and his team are working on that. But what we found was from a policy and a procedure standpoint, we have lots of tools that we can already use to um, really um, magnify how we're making a difference. You know, it's everything from COVID to how we're using our qualified rehab folks, right, to provide um, contract services, as well as making sure we're not creating uh, bid packages that exclude people, right? They're too big of a package um, to um, enable folks to participate. So Mark, did you want to add any more on how we're gonna show our performance uh, to the board. Yes, th thank you very much, Diane. I I'm gonna talk about two things. One is I, the issue on workforce development, I think is, is really important. So with the equity team that we had, which was half employees and half leadership, they went through this process to try to think, we can't focus on everything. What are the things that are most meaningfully to fo focus on? And two of them were workforce, one of them was procurement, one was culture. One of the workforce one was was how to look at um, internships and apprenticeships. We do have a trainee program that we've had here for a long time, the uh, wastewater operator, the operator trainee program has been very successful to bring people in the pipeline, but we're now starting to look at how we pilot an instrumentation electrical uh, training program, as well as a maintenance training program and trying to do that with an equity lens, trying to reach out to uh, communities that normally we don't, how do we partner on that? Now the question on COVID, which was one of the other four areas is, we talked about this a little bit in terms of looking at our total spending and our total spending in the last year that we looked at it was about, I'm trying to think I've got it right here, was in the neighborhood of uh, $62 million and about 4% of that or $2.9 million went to COVID qualified firms. Um, in a lot of ways, that's the only thing that's meaningful for is as a benchmark, 
because um, I don't think it's, we haven't pushed buttons or pulled levers associated necessarily. It's kind of knowing where we are. And that's, so that will be where we'll start benchmarking. Those are the type of things that will be expressed in our, as we do this roadmaps, as we do these department level roadmaps. Those are the type of things that I expect the board will hold us responsible for. You're welcome. Uh, could I ask? Could I ask you quickly? What was that? What were those numbers again? Well, I'm. You know, I knew you were going to ask me that question. Let me get here. Um, Sixty-two so million we, we in spent, total. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We spent sixty-one point nine sixty-one point nine million dollars in procurement, and that was in fiscal year twenty-one. And of that, about two point eight million went to COVID firms. So. That that's less important as it is that it was four point seven percent of total spending. Oh. Uh. Mark, if I may just add one more thing is that from the um, the technology support perspective, I know that the procurement team is collaborating with the Washington County's procurement team on and learning about the techniques that has been implemented at the county. I know that the digital solutions and the, the procurement team are looking and exploring into the option of implementing B2G now, which is a software that will help us collect vendor data on their diversity um, stance in their work, as well as how they are supporting the equity uh, in their work. So that we're definitely collaborating and uh, coordinating with the county and learn from each other a lot in that area. And hopefully that adds to the answer to your question, Mr. Hamilton. Lori, did you have a question? Thank you. Uh, just a comment. Um, I work for an organization that has worked really hard on diversifying our contractors and uh, especially the on-call contractors that we do so much business with. One of the things that we've invested a lot in is training. And I know you mentioned that word as well. Specifically what we've been, um, I don't know a lot about this, somebody else at Metro does, but specifically um, we've been working with contractors over time, uh, potential contractors to help them figure out what they'd need even to be a COVID firm um, or even to get the notifications of contracts. And also like if they wanted to do work with Metro, precisely what sorts of um, uh, qualifications, certifications and so forth. And we help them and we also, uh, hold workshops on how to apply effectively. Thanks. I think that's part of trying to partner a little bit with the county too. I mean, how, how can we do that? Okay. Chair Song, do you have a question? Up, oh, and you're on mute. Up, oh, Terry, you're still on mute. Yep, my space bar is not working. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, I guess first, uh, should we move on to general questions about the overall proposed budget before we move to public comments? I think so. I do see one more question from Chair Harrington, or I don't know, maybe five more questions. I, see right. I was going to ask my question. Oh, Go good. ahead. Go ahead. I'm not sure uh, where I saw it in the budget, but there was mention of the federal funds, the IIJA. I was wondering, are there specific grants that we are pursuing or for specific, specific projects in the next fiscal year? So thank you for that question. That is a really good question. In fact, we have our federal government affairs consultant actually in town next week, working with staff to build a five-year funding plan to look at how we might be able to leverage um, IIJA funding as well as state funding, because some of that funding is a lot of that funding is coming through like DEQ's Clean Water Revolving Fund. So it's federal money, but it comes to the state. The other thing that I think we could have been more explicit in the budget there is within the IIJA, there was a significant acceleration in the Bureau of Reclamation's dam safety program. And Scoggins Dam is in that queue. So what happened there is, is we anticipate that the Scoggins project is going to come up sooner. It's not gonna be a next year's budget, right? But it, it, it's gonna be more in the five-year window instead of the 10-year window. And we're, we really wanna make sure that we keep it in that window and don't slip to a window that's further down the way. Thank you. Uh, Chair Harrington. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I uh, haven't sorted out 
and I failed to find an electronic copy of the budget document to just do a search on. So I'm hoping that somewhere in the budget document, it reminds me for Ripple, right? There's the new building out in Forest Grove that uh, is occupied. And I'm looking for the reminder of what is the plan for further building out that facility uh, and how does that show up in the budget? So um, I'm assuming it's in there somewhere. If somebody could just tell me what section I need to go read, great. Otherwise, we can take it offline and, and I can follow up with Mark or Diane later. So, so Nate, is that something that you can address? Do you have it at your fingertips? I can address it, but I don't think it's in the, uh, in the budget document in the form that Chair Harrington's asking. Okay. I think we, we reference it in the, the capital the CIP planning in the back, but we don't call it out specifically that, that I'm aware of in any of the, uh, the narrative. Okay, I'll take it offline. I don't want to mm -hmm. spend, spend everybody else's time on it. It's okay. And I will also say for the benefit of the advisory commission members that are on the budget committee, our next uh, CWAC meeting is actually going to be in person at Ripple. So we'll get an opportunity to... to to see that site and what's being proposed there. Great. So uh, with that, uh, Clerk Moss, I believe we'll move to public comments on the budget. Thank you, Chair Song. Would any members of the public listening in right now uh, like to add comments for up to two minutes to the budget committee? I'll give you just a moment to raise your hands. Not seeing any hands, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Clerk Moss. I'll mark we move to summary and motion to approve. Hey, Kath, Kath, Kathy, I believe that's yours. Yeah, yeah. So, the, was there any other questions from the budget committee that we needed to answer first? Looks like Matt had a question. actually got a few and I apologize if I didn't if I'm not asking them at the right time because I think there was probably a time earlier where maybe I should have raised it so um so but I've got a few um and I'll start with the first one being the um STC reserves that was 33 35 million dollars in STC river reserves but we're increasing the STCs for sanitary and storm is that a standard reserve that we keep in place? I know we, we had a conversation earlier about the level of reserves we keep in place for with rates. Is it the same kind of discussion as it, as it pertains to the SDCs as well? Yeah, I, I can speak to that, that as we're working on our reserve policy, we are evaluating adequate reserves within this, the SDC funds to going forward. We utilize those as we look at projects in the next year that are eligible and we transfer funds out of that 107 and, and 207 into the construction funds if we have eligible projects. We also utilize on the sanitary side some of that for debt service. Was, is, and so is that is that an elevated amount or is that kind of the norm? Is it, is it, is, is it elevated because we didn't make more investments in prior years because of COVID? Um, um, we definitely didn't do transfers in, in the, in the prior fiscal year because of, you know, lower capital construction happening in that year. And we also have our, our debt service has been trending down. So transfers into there have, have re reduced over time, but we definitely are looking at and evaluating what the reserve level should be in there and making sure then that if we do have eligible projects happening in subsequent years that we do draw on those funds. Okay. Um, and so the, my next question has to do with um, the planning for new urban areas. And so, I mean, we've got a lot of activity going on in, uh, in South Hillsboro's continued um, King City. And then uh, obviously we have future reserve areas. I, there was some reference to work happening uh, in, in Brookman Road, Sherwood area. 
is there other work that the district's doing in these planning areas that's just not specifically highlighted that's part of kind of a different tax uh, set of tasks or um, is that in a, a future year's budget that we might be seeing more capital investments or does that fall under our partners in the cities? Does that fall under their budgets? I can help with that. So there's two pieces. So the district is working on the uh, master planning for our facilities. So it's looking at the large diameter um, interceptors and the pump stations and the treatment facilities that will be needed. So the team finalized the um, East Basin Master Plan. They'll be working on the West Basin Master mm -hmm. Plan. We also need to work with our city partners in terms of their planning uh, for those um, expansion areas. So it's really an iterative process between um, the cities and their planning for their local systems and the district planning for the, the bigger infrastructure to serve it. Um, so the Brookman area is one of the first ones that is um, out of the chute because of the new high school and the development that's happening in that area. Yeah, so we are doing all of that uh, pre-planning and that's why it's tied to the systems development charges, right? We need to have the SDCs to be able to um, be able to plan and begin building um, the infrastructure um, in these uh, areas. So, um, and we, we do the pump stations and the and the interceptor lines, right? The 27 inches and larger, whatever it is. Yeah, 24 inches and larger and the treatment technologies, yeah, at the plants, yeah. as well as um, for the stormwater, it's making sure we have enough um, ability within the, the creek corridors to accept the additional uh, flows that will be coming uh, because of development. So there's the pieces of stormwater that's focused on the local, right? Getting the water from the home or the business away. But once we send it away, it still needs water quality treatment, quantity management, and then ultimately connect to the resource. So the district's role is really on the resource itself as well as the specific plans for the unincorporated and small cities. But our, our primary folk, our focus is the East and West Basin Master Plans work. Mm -hmm. the, the other work is 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 led more by the, the cities. Correct. Okay. Um, and I don't want to uh, take too much time, but um, the uh, mental housing and uh, that being such a hot topic everywhere, and I know it's going to definitely have an effect on our um, capacity within our systems and, and what, we, what we're anticipating needing to, to manage in the, uh, in the future. There wasn't really any, and it's, it's new, I know, but there wasn't really any reference to um, investments being made in figuring that out. Um, and I'm just wondering is, is where does that fall within the budget? That's a really good question because it's a new, it's a policy that we're grappling with in the region. So from a sewer um, system in a stormwater system perspective, the underlying lines that are in the local streets have the ability to, um, to accommodate um, middle housing and, and other types of um, housing to deal with affordableness uh, and issues. So it isn't until we need to actually, the, the development gets large enough that it has an impact to the infrastructure. And then at that time, we would assess that. But for now, we're able to accommodate the um, developments that are going on. There are more policy questions as it, re as it relates to, is there some sort of financing or support as it relates to systems development charges um, in the long run? So that will be an up coming policy that we're going to um, be working um, with the board on. We're, we're getting more and more requests, but for now we need the funds to be able to um, build, um, making sure we have the treatment capacity and et cetera to accommodate the growth. But certainly it's not impacting us um, um, from a ability to serve right now. So I guess that was part of a, a, a follow-up question is, is there, have we had any policy conversations about uh, SDCs and uh, maybe even waiving SDCs for more affordable housing types and middle housing types and ADUs and, and, and that, those kind of um, product? So right now, those policy questions have not been raised. Um, 
in terms of new policies for um, that grouping of customers. But I want to say that right now with our cost of services analysis and also the SDC analysis that we're teeing up, those are certainly, we are trying to get the as is um, really well defined and to see what capacity that we have. Um, but right now there's, there's no um, policy yet to waive um, systems development charges. There was a conversation prior to um, the pandemic um, that took a, a bit of a look at it. Um, we were trying to figure out other, it's not necessarily the systems development charge, but it's really the whole package. And we wanted to be able to work with the developers that were um, providing that, um, the middle housing or the affordable housing to see if there's other parts of the package that um, there would be assistance on. So, but you're teeing up a very relevant question and I know our board members are all hearing and, and listening to um, the question that you're, you're teeing up. It's, it's difficult. I mean, Washington County is the second biggest city in the state, basically. And we, um, because we're split up into these different service districts, it makes those conversations that much more difficult because everybody has their own board. So um, it's important that we always think about it, though. Um, and the, the last question I had was um, captive is our it's our own self-insurance plan, isn't it? Correct. Why is, why is it in Hawaii? Uh, is, that, is that for uh, for somebody's travel plans or something? Uh, so we, when we decided to form the captive insurance company, we looked at the locations where there were potential to do the domiciles. So we first looked at Oregon, but Oregon does not have the structure to support the captive insurance. So we then had the choice between Vermont or the choice between Hawaii, and it was actually cheaper to do the operations in Hawaii. Certainly, we're always looking to see when we can bring the domicile back to Oregon, but for now, it, we're not able to do that. Oregon would need to change its um, state laws to be able to do it. I was just curious. Thank you. Well, and just for everyone's benefit, and Diane will definitely correct me, uh, the Captive Insurance Corporation, Quick has a separate board uh, Commissioner Rogers happens to be on that board. Uh, so uh, the rest of your elected board is not uh, part of part of that. Um, and CWI is separately as separate as well. Right, I wanted to check in, Roy, did you want to add to anything else um, for Matt Wellner's question? Diane, about you, Diane, you just said my name. Yeah, so Roy, I was wondering if yeah. you wanted to add any more um, perspective about the Clean Water Insurance Company's uh, domicile and or to provide any insight for Matt. I, I don't think Matt. That it, it's an interesting company. It, it uh, in terms of uh, savings, I, I think uh, you as a corporation might want to look at uh, a captive insurance company as well. You know about. 30, 40% of your premium goes to the agents for their fees, not, not the insurance. And with the large structural uh, investments that uh, Clean Water has to, to uh, insure, uh, our premiums are uh, tremendously high. And so uh, actually this was not any of the people on this particular call's idea. It was uh, Victoria Nolan who used to be with the organization. She'd seen these and brought that to our attention and we looked at it and said, well, why not save a bunch of money? Uh, the Hawaii issue was I asked the same thing and uh, it's, uh, we always think of that being some exotic place, but it's not that far away in terms from the West Coast versus the East Coast going, you know, to Vermont. And they're, they're much, uh, they're, they're much, uh, I, I've been there to listen to their program and, they're, they're much more in tune with what uh, the large companies are doing. They have, at, at a conference that I've attended there, they, they have um, little tiny players like Alaska Airlines, Intel, uh, you know, Google. Uh, it goes on and on and on. So it, it, it's a huge saver of money. It really, really is. And it, 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 it's an interesting prospect. So Diane, I don't know what else you wanted me to add, add, add or if Matt, you have more questions. But good question. 
Uh, it was uh, for me. It was uh, literally just curiosity. So uh, thank you for thank you for the explanation. Thank you. I think we're back to you, Kathy. All right. Thank you, Mark. So um, right here, the, this is the financial summary um, of the proposed budget for fiscal year 23, showing a balance of total resources and total requirements. We're now asking the budget committee to make a motion with regards to the requirements for the budget based on our budget presentation and public comment that you have received. Next slide, please. And this is helpful in, in, in motion making. It requires a, a, a motion and a second <laughs> and approval. For, uh, so moved, please. Do we have a, we have a seconding? Second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? With that, the motion. Um, passes me unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, all of you today. Um, after, after a slow morning, we still are only getting you out of here about 15 minutes later than we thought. Um, I, I really appreciate it. There is, this is really important. It is very important. It means a great deal to my team on this uh, screen, but also throughout the entire day, I'm getting text messages on my phone from various staff members saying, oh, I'm glad they asked that question and don't forget to say this. So there's a lot of attention on this internally, I know, because this is very meaningful. So thank you very much. What happens now is with this, with this budget recommended, it'll go before our board for a public hearing, both the rates and charges and the budget as an overall. And I think the chair would probably know this better than I do. I believe it's on the 21st of June is where that action is. Is that correct, Kathy? Good. Okay, good. So we will, we will continue to uh, push out information on the budget in the next month to encourage other people if they have other information that they'd like to, other comments uh, that they'd like to submit in advance of the public hearing or at the public hearing, they can. But with that, I just want to say thank you very much. And I, I want to hand it over to Diane if you wanted to close us out here before we say. Uh, Mark, do you mind if I interrupt with just a quick thank you um, for presenting this information at the CWAC committee? Because that was really helpful to have. I think everybody on the CWAC commission should know that. And, um, and it was also helpful to, to this budget committee. Thank you very much. I just want to say thanks to Terry Song for uh, leading us through. Great job, Terry. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Treese. It was glad to help out. I just want to thank everyone for all of your time uh, preparing and reading through our documents and, and to the Clean Water Services team that um, put this presentation together. There is just so much more we wanted to talk about and share, and you got a little bit of highlights of your questions about some of the things we'll continue to share about the programs that we're working on, and um, we very much appreciate um, our board and uh, CWAC. So thank you, and um, I'm hoping you have a great rest of your Friday, and um, we look forward to bringing this proposal forward to the board for adoption consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Everybody much. Have a great day. Stay dry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>